let me uh, let me introduce everybody. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Directors Club Podcast. I'm Bill Ackerman. Uh, I've been a guest on this show twenty or so times, and so Jim has invited me to take over uh, the reins part time on the show. And uh, he and I are going to be trading hosting duties back and forth uh, for this season, uh, so that Jim has time to enjoy life a little bit more. And uh, so I had Jim's blessing to shine a light on a few more esoteric directors if I wanted to. And for this episode, I wanted to have a conversation about Stephen Sadian, uh, a director uh, that might have fallen through the cracks a little bit for some viewers. I think it's been a little bit harder to see his films without any DVD or Blu-ray releases. And I don't even think they've ever had legitimate availability on any of the bigger streaming platforms, but uh, his films have always meant a lot to me. And um I wanted to have a conversation, and so I, I, I reached out to the two people that first occurred to me uh, to talk about uh, Stephen Sadian's work. Now, the first guest I have is a film critic. Uh, you may have read her in Animus, Little White Lies, RogerEbert.com, Clio. She's a film programmer for Fantasia Underground, Cinema Moderne, screen editor at Cult MTL, the uh, Montreal Alt Weekly. Uh, she's been involved in Blu-rays. Uh, I just listened to a great commentary she did for Nightcap, the Chabral film. So uh, welcome to the show, Justine Smith. Thank you so much. I'm super pumped to be here. <laughs> And uh, my other guest is someone I've done at least five other shows with now. This will be uh, our, our, at least our fifth or sixth collaboration on a podcast. But uh, she's a film, music, cultural writer. Uh, you may have read her in Diabolique, Dangerous Minds, Video Watchdog, Rue Morgue, or on the websites to Arrow or Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, she's the co-author of the Bizarro Encyclopedia of Film with John Skip. Uh, she's the co-host of the Hell's Bells podcast with Kat Ellinger, uh, the contributor to so many podcasts and home video releases, and someone who's been working on a book on today's subject, Stephen Sadian. And uh, so welcome to the show, Heather Drain. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And the check is in the mail, so yes. don't, don't cash it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and actually Directors Club podcast listeners might have heard you and Jim talking about music videos on here a few years back, which is a lot of fun. Oh, People that should. was such a fun episode. Jim's a total sweetheart. So Jim, yes. if you're listening to this, we love you. <laughs> So this director, I, I guess what I would want to start is because I, I think this is going to be a new director to a lot of listeners. And so I, I guess I wanted to get your first impressions, both of you what your first introduction to Steven Sadian's work was and what was your first reaction to it? I mean, I think <laughs> I got introduced to Steven's work um, in a very like programmy kind of way where uh, Daniel Bird, uh, who works in creating DVDs, programming, he's worked very closely with Ulowski and he works very closely with Steven, uh, sent me kind of out of the blue this link to a movie called Dr. Caligari. And he said, we're restoring this film. I think you're going to love it. Uh, would you consider playing a Fantasia? I watched it and I had never seen anything like that in my entire life. It absolutely blew my mind. And I'm like, I sent it to everyone at Fantasia. And of course, like most of the people at Fantasia were already very familiar with Steven because he's a legend and I was like a little bit behind. And from there, it's just like, I went like so deep and was so excited to discover his work, which is so singular and so exceptional. And actually, like, that's how I first heard about Heather, because one of my first conversations with Steven, he had actually mentioned you. So, Oh, my that God. Was super cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, that's... um. <laughs> I'm so glad the video won't be seen to listeners. I'm like, oh my god, that's so sweet. No, that's, uh, gosh, and what a beautiful way to get to discover Stephen's work, though, because um, you know Daniel. Daniel's amazing, and I know Daniel's been on Bill's other show, yeah. supporting characters, which is a great episode. Mm -hmm. And yeah, no, when you that's the beautiful thing about discovering Stephen's work is that every single thing he creates is wholly his own work. Like he really is a true auteur. And so when you kind of get invited to that world of Sadie and it's always such a special ride. My discovery of Steven, um, which I, I won't try to go too deep because I know Bill Bill's heard this story like 80 times, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but when I was around 11 years old, our library had a copy of Danny Peary's Cult Movies 3. And I was like, ooh, you know, cult movies, what is this? And I, you know, immediately poured into it and they had a chapter, or he has a chapter on Cafe Flesh. One or two of the pages are missing. <laughs> Because um, this was an era before the internet, so people, like, especially kids in small southern towns, would basically, if there's anything that had any hint of a nipple mm -hmm. or a wiener, would be taking the photos out of books. Uh, that's my assumption, at least. And so for years, I never got to finish that chapter. But what I did get to read of it, I was, it stuck in my mind. You know, I was like, wow, this is... 
what is this? This sounded amazing. And, you know, na- seeing names like Rinse Dream, you know, and Post Atomic. It's like, oh. And so I thought about it for years. Of course, I didn't get to see it till I was, you know, an adult in my early mid 20s. Thanks to a um, <laughs> to a tax return, <laughs> I got to uh, purchase Cafe Flesh Night Dreams and Party Doll Go Go. I just went. I just I just knew. Like I'd seen clips, and I was hooked. And then I saw all three films, and I was hooked, a hundred percent. And um, so yeah, and it's just been you know just trying to discover more and more of his stuff. Like whether you're talking about the work in Hustler, or his music video work, which is absolutely because uh, another sort of passion of mine is music video history. And Steven is such a very special part of that too, which I don't know if a lot of people uh, know, but, um, but yeah. And, and Bill, how did you, like, what was your, what was your path to, I, I, to Sadian? I, I think it was, I, I'm actually trying to remember the order because I was looking for cafe flesh for years because of uh, cult movies three, um, which like yourself, I was a big, and still I'm a big Danny Perry fanatic. And, uh, but I, I didn't have easy access to vintage adult films as a teenager. <laughs> and uh, I, so I might've seen Dr. Caligari first, which I remember renting from the cult section of a video store. And um, my late friend, James Izzo, who does the music uh, with me for supporting characters, uh, he and I watched that together and, uh, and we became obsessed with it because it was just so unusual and funny. And I mean, we had some kind of touchstones for like what surrealism was. We knew about David Lynch and people like that, but it was really not like anything else we had seen. And then Cafe Flesh, I may have rented it from Kim's video or I might have found it locally. I can't remember, but that was just a you know revelation because I'd never really seen an adult film that was... Um, so much like like a midnight movie, I guess, you know, like that had mm-hmm. like everything that I would respond to in something like Eraserhead, but it just happened to have the hardcore element. And I mean, I knew I knew that was going to be the case because of what Danny Perry had wrote about it. Like I knew it was not going to be a traditional movie, but it, it reminded me so much of things like Liquid Sky and things that had like these kind of um, early 80s punk rock kind of feeling to it. And I just, it just kind of struck me. And then I didn't know what happened to him. I mean, it wasn't like you could find a lot of information about Rinse Dream, you know, or Steven Sadian. And um, I didn't even know about the existence of Night Dreams until like decade or so later. And uh, it's actually how I found out at the Projection Booth podcast was because a friend of mine had said like, oh, you should check out this show, the Projection Booth, because they did an episode on this unusual kind of horror art porn film called Night Dreams. And then I looked into Night Dreams like, oh my God, it's another Rinse Dream movie. I didn't think there was anything else. And then when I met you, it's like you were telling me about, you know, Party Doll Go Go. And like, I didn't know that there was like this other series of works. And then um, I think when Dress to Kill came out through Criterion and there's a featurette with him talking about his time doing the poster work, which totally changed the way I looked at Night Dreams because some of the sequences in it feel like drawn from from that side of his career. And it just, I, I don't know, it, it, like every time I go deeper and deeper into it, like the humor gets richer, the imagery seems even more striking. And Justin, you've seen the new restoration of Dr. Caligari. I can't even imagine how it looks like finally cleaned up. I've only ever grown up with it in the VHS yeah. transfer from the 80s. Yeah, It looks incredible. And it's like seeing it for the first time and it feels so contemporary. Like it's like crazy when you see just like what they've done with it. And you kind of like speak to like how rich and colorful his filmmaking is. And I know that we screened it like, unfortunately because of COVID it, we did not get to play it in a movie theater at Fantasia. Mm-hmm. But just watching people react to it live on Twitter was just like an absolute like hoot just because <laughs> so many people, like half the people were like, oh my God, like I've finally seen this movie. Like even the version I saw was like a rip that was like still not restored. And it was like still nice, but it's like seen on the next level. And then you have people who had never seen it who are just like, I've never seen a movie like this. And again, <laughs> it just looks, it really looks incredible and like sounds amazing. Like again, like I like want to have a chance to like play that in a movie theater as soon as possible, just yeah. because like that's what it deserves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's funny because it, I realized Doctor Caligari was the last film I got to see because um, the only place you could buy a DVD copy of it was uh, actually technically a porn side it was legal but um like it was in this gray area because of the producer and that's why like one of the many reasons why i like think you know god bless daniel and 
you know, thankfully, like, Steven's got the rights again, because for years, but the reason I couldn't get this DVD copy, I actually tried to buy it, was at the time, they wouldn't ship to Arkansas, which is where I live. <laughs> um, which is weird, because I've never had any other problems. I obviously didn't have a problem, you know, getting Cafe Flash or, you know, any number of movies, but for some reason, this site in particular... Uh, would not, which is weird because it's, you know, it's Dr. Calgary. It's R rated. It wasn't even like I was getting like butt bongo number six or whatever, <laughs> you know? Um, but when I finally did get to see it, it was, yeah. And especially because after reading about it, because I actually, I still have somewhere in our, in our house, um, Fangoria had like a little piece on it. And I always remember the still of Fox Harris's head in the mm. fridge. And he's got that big, amazing grin, like, that only Fox Harris can have. And I was just like, what? What is, you know, I must, you know, every little scene I kept seeing that was Sadian-related throughout, like, my teenhood and everything. I was like, oh, my God, I must discover this this man's work. Yeah. And, yeah, I've only seen, like, a little clip of the restored version that they kind of teased. And, oh, my God, it looks so gorgeous. It's so, it feels like such a treat to have Steven's work get treated like that because um for so many years his stuff has kind of been in you know kind of you know you've almost had to kind of resort to have the time getting a dupe or you know downloading a torrent or, yeah. or whatever and and some of those and even some of the legally available it's like the the transfers of cafe flesh and night dreams on the vcx releases are i mean they're vhs it's clearly from a vhs copy and it's like it's kind of like damn i mean like this is such a great movie it feels <laughs> kind of i mean you take what you can get but it's like they deserve and he deserves so much better i mean that's kind of the bitch is like so many adult filmmakers uh of that era a lot of those companies like didn't even really respect their libraries and still in some cases still don't so it's always like an uphill battle because you know mainstream critics and mainstream society already are kind of judging you because it's always just porno it's just dumb porno but this isn't porn this isn't and it's certainly not dumb you know this is art and that's always something i've always been attracted to it's just like well what makes something art versus porn you know and i find a lot of times it's a, almost like a classism thing you know if something plays in an art house and maybe has a little bit of transgressive explicitness in it like say uh Catherine Brule oh that's edgy it's art but say a guy like Stephen Sadian did it or a guy like Gerard Damiano does it mm-hmm. though they're pornographers and yeah. I just I you know so that's something I've always been really kind of passionate about is just being like getting certain artists the respect hopefully in my own meager way <laughs> Uh, deserves because I think Stephen I think he's one of the most exciting American filmmakers that have emerged in the past 40 or 50 years and definitely like all of his stuff to me is such a great kind of byproduct of a post-atomic age Americana because it's like in, in almost all of his films if not all of them you have references to 50s and 60s pop culture and Atomic references, obviously, Cafe Flesh is the most obvious one. And so you have the, the dark humor, the fear, in some cases, and as well as just like that great artist's eye, too. It's like you have all the great sort of like almost German expressionistic sets, but yet he's able to kind of transmogify, you know, a lot of them into his own way. I spot watched a little bit of Night Dreams 2, which I'm really rusty on the sequels. The first one is still kind of the king of that, <laughs> of the trilogy. But there's even like a pornographic woodcut type art, like um, I think Lottie Renniger, like the German animator from the 20s. Like if you see her stuff, which is so gorgeous, it's almost like that, but it's like, you know, it's a wang. And so it's kind of like, it's like having this like... This mix is so amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm so excited about the future. It's so, there's so many years, like you said, Bill, where it's just a lot of us, we didn't even know if Steven was like still with us. I mean, I remember yeah. he popped up in a book called Gods and Spandex. And that was like the first sign of like, okay, he's still out there, you know? And uh, and now, God, how lucky we are. He's He did a fabulous masterclass and we're getting restorations. So it's exciting. Yeah, I, I think in the last year, I mean, you had the new 4K restoration of Dr. Caligari that played Fantasia, and that's going to come out this year uh, through Mondo Macabro, I think in UHD as well as Blu-ray. A little while back, you had Fun City Editions putting out the uh, the music of Mitchell Froome mm-hmm. on uh, vinyl for Cafe Flesh. And um, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode first, timing-wise, is because Daniel Bird is going to restore Cafe Flesh 
Uh, so that's going to, uh, I guess, move forward this year as well, uh, which is really exciting. And uh, so I just wanted to you know, get more awareness about who this director is and why you know you should be excited to see his work getting these new reissues. And uh, I mean, you can find illegitimate streaming versions of all of his movies online. I mean, mm-hmm. but... Um, you know, it's it's going to be great to see them with proper restorations because they're visually, even in those like VHS transfers, quite striking films. So I can only imagine how they're going to look when they're properly restored. I guess maybe where we start is just talking about, um, I mean, I don't know how much of a biography we need necessarily to fill in, but I mean, he's someone that comes from photography. And mm-hmm. I think it's interesting how he comes from satirical advertising. And maybe, I, Heather, do you know to what extent he had uh, off-Broadway type theater in his past before the films? I know that he does theater after Cafe Flesh, but did he do any theater prior to Night Dreams? That's a really great question. I'm not I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. I definitely, I know it seemed like the real height of his theater involvement was the 80s, particularly like the mid 80s. Um, and in fact, some of the cast we get in Calgary were from that, like John Durbin and Fox Harris. And um, but that's a really good question. I don't know. I'm not sure. I would guess just based on the timeline of how young he was when he started at Hustler that there might not have been that much time until mm. later on. But I, I, I can't confirm that for sure okay. either. Okay. I mean, I guess it's even just worth pointing out, like, Stephen is obviously still with us, but it's like, this is kind of like the exciting thing about his career, too, is that... There, it, like you can't just go to Wikipedia and like find stuff because <laughs> he's been so underground for so long. And like, what I think is amazing is that he's had this new opportunity to kind of be the person to tell his own story because, like as Heather said, he's such a raconteur. He's such a great storyteller, and. I feel as though he's done so much with his life that like sometimes like an offhand comment you're like for most people that like little sentence you just did would be like the highlight of your life and for him it's like just like a footnote that is 100% accurate (laughs) that is that is the true true oh my god yes yeah and I think that's such a cool point too um, Justine because you know it hits me like almost everything that Stevens worked in has been like either legit underground culture or something that's it's tied to a media that's not that usually doesn't get a lot of critical preservation respect like you know underground theater um working for hustler magazine uh you know music videos i mean even to this day like trying to research and i'm talking music videos that run in tv like i'm not even talking like the the really the true underground music videos like mainstream stuff it's still hard to figure out sometimes who directed what because it was viewed as such throwaway culture and that's the thing too, Stephen. You know, also came from a, a world of advertising, like not just with the Hustler, but with other things too. Uh, in fact, he, I know he told me a story about getting to do the photography, like doing band photos of the Manhattan Transfer, mm. which, if you're not familiar with them, are seriously one of the widest most no soul having bands ever like uh, to the point where i would actually call them the real satanic music not motley Crue, not slayer um it's totally manhattan transfer but he said that when they went at the studio they could see like some of his art and examples of his work on the walls and they were like horrified which made me kind of like hate that band even more i would <laughs> Like, how dare you, Philistines? I mean, it's not bad enough, like, to rape the legacy of Glenn Miller, but, you know, you have to <laughs> judge this great artist. But, um, but yeah, and um, and that's such a great point, especially because we do live in an age where it's easy kind of to take biographical information and just information in general, not for granted, but we do live in an information age. So it is kind of interesting to have. I mean, as much as I've been studying Stephen's work, there's, I have no doubt there's so many things I still need to learn about, especially with the theater the theater what i know about it that end of it is exciting and awesome but i I feel like i definitely need to to learn more about it yeah everything i read about jackie charge it sounded Mm -hmm. like it would be the missing link between cafe flesh and dr caligari as far as a story but uh Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i was thinking about like uh looking at his work that uh that he did for Hustler that, you know, appears in the in the master class, Justin, that you did and and that kind of work. I was thinking about how like maybe you could see him in a tradition with people like 
Jerry Schatzberg or Gordon Parks or William Klein, as far as like photographers that become filmmakers. I mean, as far as like somebody that already had an eye for the kind of compositions that they liked and the kind of themes that they liked, but um, they jumped straight from that world into film. It, you think about like certain painters becoming filmmakers and it's, it's just a different thing. Like it doesn't come from making short films or working with actors in theater. Like he's coming from he's thinking in visuals first. It, the, the funny thing about his movies is how, even though that's true that they are like visually quite stylized, they're also such dialogue heavy movies, like in, and, and quirky, unusual dialogue that I th- always thought that that marriage of like offbeat writing and like very specific visuals was what kind of made him the most um, distinctive in his mm-hmm. field. I mean, what, what first jumped out at you? I mean, when you saw the films, was it, was it the, oh. the, the dialogue or the, the, the imagery? Was it both? Or? Um, I mean, for me, I think it was the imagery, but because it's just like so exceptionally beautiful. And like, I, I watch a lot of um, porn, <laughs> classic <laughs> porn and everything. Like, so it's like one, he's coming in an era that you don't normally associate with so much innovation and so much like, artistry from the porn industry and even if he were to come in kind of the golden age of the 1970s he would still be an outlier on every single level uh but then it's like you start to feel like the delirium of like how poetic the dialogue and the kind of like it is almost musical the way that the dialogue flows and it's so clever and so out there and I think like there's this first impulse, particularly like if you're watching it with other people, like it's like it could be very funny and uh, easy to kind of make fun of. But it's also at the same time just like genius. And so to me, like the visuals do come first. And then I would say the the music, but I would include the dialogue uh, and the kind of discourse as part of that musicality, mm. just because I feel like that informs so much of the rhythm of the hits movies and the kind of feel of them, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, the... um gosh because I feel like when I first started really getting to see clips of his films and getting into the films it was like the whole pastiche of it all like um and even like I remember because um before I got to have Party Dolly Go Go somebody on YouTube it did a little safe for work montage and just you know hearing dialogue like you know wow she's deep I bet she's read The Hobbit and you're like what (laughs) <laughs> it's just like so he can he can have the funniest line but also still make something incredibly like i think cafe flesh is such a beautiful and heavy absolutely melancholic film which i don't think is the word that's often associated with steven's work i mean oh yeah i mean because dr calgary is definitely not melancholic <laughs> but something also like yeah like the audio all of the audio the dialogue the music but also just the way he'll layer sounds mm-hmm. in um, that's one of the reasons I would kill to have a cleaned up version of, of Night Dreams because particularly like in the hell sequence, like you can what you can tell is amazing, but it's just like the copies, like ugh. but um it's just brilliant. I think a lot of filmmakers don't even like not just an adult, just in general, uh, don't always take into account how you can build layers upon layers of your audio with layers and layers of imagery um i always find when people do that to be like really exciting it's like what kind of atmosphere and world can you really create with that the other thing that's really interesting is that steven's films particularly like those first three have a theme of women like strong women trying to either fulfill their desires and being held back by a man but sometimes for different reasons because like in night dreams and dr calgari you have the character of that mrs van houten who is basically referred to as kind of like a, you know, a suburban wench with like two credit cards and a, what is it she's saying, Calgary? Like, you know, he had an erection once. Silly, really. <laughs> like, you know, just like th- this woman just, you know, frothing mad of, pa- of like need a passion and fulfillment. Cause I mean, goddamn, she's married to a guy that can't give her an orgasm. Yeah. You know, who wouldn't feel repressed in that? And you think about like 1950s and 60s America and how that kind of mirrors that just all this repression bubbling at the surface just clawing its way to get out and of course cafe flesh has a different take on it because you know in that case nick isn't trying to repress her he's just he's been repressed by what's happened in the world you know he's been robbed of being able to physically love his lover because of you know the nuclear age so but that I mean, think about it. i mean that's you know like 
how many filmmakers, I mean, there are other filmmakers in adult who have had strong female characters, but that approach, the way Steven approaches it is so, like everything else he does, is so his own. I mean, even in Party Dolly Go goes one and two, I mean, you don't really have like women being, women are being fulfilled by men all throughout that. <laughs> There's yeah. not a lot of repression, but the women are always the strong, like they're definitely like the strongest characters for sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about about Night Dreams, which it's it's a little interesting because he's not the credited director. It's Francis Delia under the pseudonym FX Pope, who's the credited director. But I know he's a little bit elusive about like who really directed it in the interview sometimes. Like mm-hmm. he, he sort of implies that it was a, you know, not quite so cut and dry like the roles that everyone had on that film. But it is a film where you get a sense of him as a writer with Jerry Stahl. You get a sense of him as a designer of the worlds that that taking place. And so it's like he's designing the the sets and he's designing the soundtrack. So it's it's all these other places for him to be creative, whether or not he's telling the actors what to do in those dialogue scenes. The director of Cafe fleshes all over Night Dreams as far as like they, they feel like mm-hmm. like very much like sibling films to me. Just for, for, for any listeners that haven't seen the film, not that it's like a plot that we can really spoil too much. We can only really kind of spoil the jokes of it. But like it's about this woman, there's a pair of scientists that are doing tests, um, this housewife, Mrs. Van Houten. And mm-hmm. then the film is a series of the uh, erotic dreams that we're we're watching her dreams and at first you get the feeling that it could be a conventional type porno film because the the dialogue is all very kind of sexual but then the first the first scene that we have is this scene with a a masked figure and a jack in the box and you realize that we're we're in such different territory than traditional erotica and i i never made the connection uh until like watching the the featurette about his poster work that it's a riff on the uh the fun house uh, the toby hooper poster art that he designed i think it's the same um prop i like i i I feel like steven may have mentioned that like don't quote me on that 100 percent, but i'm pretty sure it may be the same same thing okay if it's if it's not it's totally adjacent yeah because it looks it it looks it looks a lot like it so and um and also the film's also kind of like a like a like a sort of a psychosexual version of dante's journey you know i mean complete with like having an inferno and a heaven like it ends with paradiso but yeah i mean it's just all these different fantasies and sort of also fears i mean you have a scene where she reaches into a guy's pants that's kind of making just like weird noises and he has like a metal stomach and she reaches in the crotch and pulls out like what looks like a rubbery dead fetus yeah and it's like you know is this the fear is this the fear of of losing a baby is it the fear of pregnancy you know it's a you know there's like that's the thing there's all these kind of cool things that really do give you something to chew on but without being too pretentious or too obvious and there's always i mean this thing steven's so great about blending in comedy you know or at least a witticism i mean because cafe flesh is pretty dark but there's still like there's still some funny lines to it to give a little bit of levity but yeah and it's funny because dorothy lemay is such an underrated actress when people talk about the great actresses of adults i don't see her get mentioned a lot and she's amazing here i really really think she's so good here and especially because yeah she didn't really from what i could tell wasn't given a lot of the heavier dramatic roles in adult i mean she was into stuff more like i think she was in high school fantasies and I think one of the tab Taboo films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking of not wanting to think about your family <laughs> in, in any sort of saucy way, but um, but she's yeah. I mean, she she's great here. What was your first impressions of that film when you saw it? I'm trying to think, the first time when I saw Night Dreams, I think I saw the trailer. I I had found. Um, through gray market means a, a a trailer compilation of uh, 70s and 80s adult films because I love film trailers and like you Justine I'm a, I'm a big uh, I'm a big fan of that era just because there's so many great films in that era that a lot of people I think miss just because of the whole thing of like oh it's adults you know whatever but um, the trailer was like oh god and you hear the heartbeat and so when you start the film you feel that heartbeat and the weird breathing and it's like already just from like frame one just intense and i just think dorothy lemay is so great in it as as mrs van houten which you gotta love the uh, manson girls nod um with the (laughs) with the names but um and what's great in night dreams 2 the female patient is called mrs atkins so (laughs) i love the the cheekiness of that but um and and it has uh 
as one of the doctors, Andy Nichols, who, of course, I think if anybody's seen Cafe Flesh, remembers him as Maxi, Max Melodramatic. And even though Andy was only in two of Stephen's films, for me, he is such a huge part when I think of Stephen's work. Because of that dialogue that Stephen and Jerry Stahl create, I think it takes a special actor to deliver that dialogue in a way where it works and it doesn't sound too stilted. Mm -hmm. It's such a noir, pseudo-noir type jazzy kind of patois at times <laughs> so it's um and i think andy nichols just you know was such a great and very underutilized actor i'm, I'm really i don't know why he didn't do more stuff um but yeah i mean i dream so you have so many you have a cream of wheat box get you know have a sex scene with the girl and he comes to life and then you have my favorite movie or my favorite scene ever in history the dancing toast while this cream of wheat box is getting a blowjob and then he starts playing the saxophone it's like just when you can't think it can't get any more just beautifully delirious and then finding out that steven is the toast yeah. um, it was like the cherry on the sunday i was like this is okay this is now the greatest movie i've ever seen <laughs> and and of course you got wall of voodoo which is the thing is that um night dreams was not the first film to use like a popular song or you know like a song by a band by any means but it's definitely such a standout cover of ring of fire with that scene especially because i think wall of voodoo is such a great band and it's such a huge part of stevens like because you know he with francis directed mexican radio and in fact, the cover of Wall of Voodoo's um, album, Call of the West, is that Sadian door, that angular door. And of course, you have two members of Wall of Voodoo on the crew for Dr. Kogari, because both Bruce Moreland and Mark Borland, uh, like held up with art and set designs. I have a suspicion Mark might have done music for Party Doll Go Go under a different name, but I can't, conf- I need to probably ask Steven. I don't know, I haven't confirmed it, because I know Mark Borland did music for uh, Adult in the 90s. Okay. Of course, I don't think he used his real name. That's the bitch about researching anything with the adult. <laughs> No. arena is very few people use the real name well it's funny because so, yeah. the director of this film is the director of photography on Abel Ferrara's uh, Nine Lives of a Wet Pussy the feature that he made before Driller Killer mm. but you won't yeah. know that from IMDb because they don't connect those profiles because uh, it's still like they don't connect those two pseudonyms <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, but, like also, uh, sometimes the pseudonyms are the same person as multiple pseudonyms, or in different things they're misspelled. Sometimes the same movie. Oh. <laughs> so it's like it's like it's such a it's such a big old mess that world. Unfortunately, because it's so rich, and I think it informs so much of like talking about like the late twentieth century. I think like as time goes on, we're gonna realize like it's the the decade defined by pornography but we didn't really preserve that kind of legacy that well for a lot of reasons mm-hmm. that you've kind of discussed a lot of the people who were producing porn had very little invested interest in actually preserving that culture and then as a society I think we've done a lot to kind of throw that all into the shadows and pretend it doesn't exist despite the mm-hmm. fact that a lot of people watch porn well it, it especially kind of reveals like you know, it's always sounded so weird that our culture treats anything that has sexuality in it like it's like automatically like throwaway and, and like, ooh, it's dirty. But it's like, well, I mean, none of us would be here without sex. I know as gross as it is because I don't like thinking about my parents having sex either, guys. But <laughs> it is a fact. But also, like, you look at about explicit sexuality, you see it in, in literature that's respected. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of it was censored, but I mean, people, Henry Miller, like, obviously, people respect Henry Miller. You have it in the fine arts, like, with the work of Egon Chalet, even Picasso. So it's like, why in, in film? You know, because to me, there's a huge difference. I mean, anybody, you can tell the difference between something that's clearly just, and there's nothing wrong with something that's prurient, but there's a huge difference between, say, like Debbie Does Dallas, which is barely a film. It should never be called a classic, in my opinion. <laughs> Anytime people are like, oh, I love classic adult film, Debbie Does Dallas, and I'm like, oh, God, I'm dying on the inside. Like, have you not seen any Alex Dorenzi? Have you not seen any Cecil Howard? What's wrong with you? You know, but versus guys like that, and like Steven, especially. I mean, Steven, and to me, it's not even, I mean, especially the Night Dreams and Cafe Flesh. I mean, it's funny. I guess Night Dreams is a little more erotic, but it's an art film. Like, why mm-hmm. Why can't, well, so why can't something be both? I mean, yeah. um, it's just so strange. You can make a drama that's, uh, you know, not as well made, has no imagination, but it's respectable. 
and that gets preserved and that gets the attention but anything with sexuality is automatically uh, like scandalous but it's kind of like Stephen's whole background with Hustler it's kind of perfect because who was the biggest first amendment fighter in our country Larry Flynn so all roads go lead back to Hustler inevitably in this field so mm. <laughs> what's funny is you compare how Night Dreams was critically really well received in the adult press like it tended to get mentioned as one of the great films of the year uh, Bill Margold who's no longer with us sadly but Bill was originally an adult actor director but also a very good writer and wrote for a lot of adult magazines and ended up um, founded a nonprofit called Paw Protection was it Protection it's like a, a group to basically help out adult performers so you know bill was a cool guy and he loved night dreams but he hated cafe flash <laughs> and I, I got the feeling a lot of people in the adult industry were super mixed because some of them viewed it as attacking them or attacking people that watch adult films a lot of people kind of view it as an anti-porn film interestingly mm-hmm. enough I, mean, I should probably just say what the plot of Cafe Flesh is because it's a it's a post apocalyptic scenario where most of the population are sex negatives. They're made ill by physical intimacy, and so they're they're part of a culture that watches the minority of sex positives uh, perform live sex acts, which they're kind of forced into. But it's commenting on the voyeurism of the people that would show up for a movie like Cafe Flesh. So when you talk about it being anti porn, I can see that reading of it because it is kind of making the adult film audience look like junkies. I mean, that's as far as like they're, they're, they're hooked on the imagery, but they look kind of wan and zombie like, like it is kind of parodying the, potential audience for a movie like Cafe Flesh. I also kind of want to talk a little bit about like what you had mentioned earlier, uh, Heather, about mm-hmm. this kind of influence from 1950s and 1960s culture on Stephen's work. And I think it's like, I remember a conversation I had with him about Anne Margaret, and I feel like there's like such a key to understanding his work through Anne Margaret, strangely enough, because when he mentioned it, it was like everything fell into place because you have like one, like I'm obsessed with Anne Margaret too. So like, I'm like completely connected on that level. And two, it's like, especially like a movie like Bye Bye Bernie, which is so pop, so colorful and so repressed. But Anne Margaret is so sexy in that movie that it's like she breaks like that kind of barrier. And she kind of in being so vibrant, so young, she kind of like dismantles just by her presence. This kind of like post-war atomic age Americana that is so innocent that it kind of like feels like he's always kind of channeling that almost like classic Hollywood on the brink, just like taking it to that extreme because all his movies to me, or at least like the three that we're mostly going to be talking about that I've seen, it's like they really kind of channel that irony and that like it's almost wholesome, even at its darkest. I would say Night Dreams is maybe the least wholesome just because it's the scariest, at least for me. It's like if you're going to go spooky, I would go for Night Dreams. But like so much of like the, the vignettes too are like touching on these like pillars of like American culture like even Jack in the Box is like I to me it's like reminds me of like these cartoons that you kind of grew up with and this kind of like innocence that's totally subverted and totally torn apart yeah well and it's it's definitely done in such a way where you're I do it's funny I've never thought of Night Dreams as like horror but I kind of love that especially because it's you know I actually recently saw a French film from 70 I want to say 75 called Les Six I'm totally gonna butcher the French Les Six Qui Parlez which was released over here as Pussy Talk because <laughs> Americans <laughs> ruin everything. Uh, and, um, well, that, no, but that would be the little translation because it's like, it, it, but it, it does, yeah, it does sound way, way worse. <laughs> it sounds so much better in French. I'm just like, I'm just going to keep saying it in French because otherwise it just, I don't know. So just to, especially hearing my accent where it's like Pussy Talk. I don't know. I just can't. <laughs> but, um, but like that would, you'd see like her, like loose, like her character has a flashback to basically deflowering herself with a Pinocchio doll but it's sort of done in a very French she's of age it's fine but it's still kind of of course they have blood on the nose what I'm sorry I'm still processing that film (laughs) but but it's funny because the way Steven does it it does feel like more it does feel like a carnival ride it does feel kind of like that sort of fun thing where it's it's sort of it's sexy but it's very kind of shadowy i mean and that's the thing even in a more erotic film like night dreams there's a lot more going on it's obviously not just the bits and pieces also none of the scenes really overstay their welcome because that can kind of be the problem even with some of the better films is after a while you're like okay come on guys wrap it up (laughs) 
wrap it up. Let's get to the next scene, you know, because there are some of us who watch it for dialogue and plot and not just the donut making. But uh, but yeah, I love the Anne Margaret, though. God, who doesn't love Anne Margaret? That's fabulous. I, she's the best. <laughs> oh, my God. She's like, oh, that's um, that makes so much sense, too. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about the old Hollywood thing while watching Cafe Flesh again, because I never really thought about the fact that they're kind of doing a riff on the bandwagon and the triplets thing with the babies on stage. And the fact that it has like that, um, I mean, it has the nod to things like cabaret, but it also feels like like the innocent girl in the big city, like showbiz. It feels like it feels like a 19, like a depression era musical to me. I don't know if that's what they were consciously trying to do. I mean, I know he talks about 1950s being an influence on the dialogue, but it, it feels like uh, like a depression era kind of musical to me almost. Uh, in, but like, instead of dance numbers, it's it's uh, these uh, sex show sequences. I never even thought about that, but like now it's like all making these connections. And it's interesting because like in the 80s too, you do have like pennies from heaven too. Like so clearly like there's something in the zeitgeist that's like revisiting that time. I don't know if it's a response to like Ronald Reagan and this like mm. strange falseness of society. I, I even thought about, and I know this is probably like a, an odd comparison, but the way that Peter Bogdanovich shot at long last love in color, but like the color palette he chose for it was like trying to appear black and white, even though they're shooting in color. And I feel like sometimes some of the Sadian stuff feels like, like it's trying to evoke black and white photography while always shooting in color. Like in terms of like the way he designs the the color palettes, like to, to favor black, white, and gray. I don't know if it's like a conscious thing to evoke old Hollywood that way. Cause they feel like, like very modern of their time kind of films in terms of the style they feel like kind of cutting edge, but yeah, with that eye looking backward, but I don't know if that was something that was always part of uh, California punk and new wave kind of art culture. Anyway, that kind of retro appreciation. Heather, would you say that that's something that was part of the zeitgeist for that culture? Um, That's such a cool question. I love that. Um, Cause it'd be really easy for somebody, especially cause I think, what main people in the mainstream kind of know about punk the knee jerk thing would probably be say like oh no but like if you read about especially la punk like the og la punks yeah especially when you're talking about people like alice bag and pleasant gay men and x is that you know a lot of them were like would go to thrift shops and wear these like gowns you know from like the 30s and the 40s and the 50s but with like ripped fishnets or they'd wear old slips uh my favorite was there was a story about a punk girl that lived at the canterbury apartments and this old lady had had, had passed away and she stole her dress this woman had this beautiful homemade dress that she always wore and nobody was coming to pick up this these ladies belongings so this punk girl was like cool this is mine <laughs> <laughs> so she's walking around like wearing this like beautiful homemade dress from the 30s or something to punk clubs so yeah i mean i definitely think that i you know because the whole thing about punk is is taking stuff from the past and the present and stitching it into your own thing yeah diy and i think i mean that's absolutely steven like and that's and i think and i love you bringing that because I've, I've been thinking a lot about how punk got so codified and a lot of people just think oh it's angry angry skinny white guys yelling and punk is so much more than that especially like 70s punk you had like men and women and you had the lgbt community you had people of different races different classes different approaches different styles um the fact that steven i believe his studio was either above or near the mask club which was like an infamous punk club it's across the street um, i think yeah um mm. of course you have wall of voodoo who were from the ashes of like the skulls who were an OG punk band and nervous gender who are really actually really cool, very vital and, and very kind of overlooked at um, like LGBT punk band. So you have that, which is so cool. And, and when we get to Dr. Caligari, there's even more like musician cameos uh, that I nerd out about because that's what I do. <laughs> but um, I love you mentioning like the musicals. That's the thing is that Steven does kind of like integrate all of this stuff in a way, but in a way that feels very authentic. I think it's kind of it can be kind of a tricky thing when a, when a current or modern filmmaker tries to have a retro or what's perceived as a retro thing in their film because you can't really go back. Like if you try, like if I try to make a '70s exploitation film now, it's never going to feel like a proper '70s exploitation film because it's not the '70s. You know, it just is. But if you're really clever and if the vision's really pure, you can integrate things in your own way. And I think his stuff absolutely does that. 
And Cafe Flesh is also, to me, I always just thought of it as a noir. It feels mm. very noir to me. Yeah. Well, it's the same year as Blade Runner. And I also think mm. of it as, you know, connected to Blade Runner because they have that same dystopian future, that same like shadowy, like evoking film noir, but like in, in some kind of uh, horrible future scenario where, I mean, uh, you have people kind of intermixing, but you don't know who's the android or the person in Blade Runner. You don't know who's the sex positive or sex negative in Cafe Flesh. Like that, that same kind of identity question thing in both of them. Uh, one thing I was thinking about with Cafe Flesh is also, I remember an old interview I had with John Waters where they asked him about Cafe Flesh and if he thought that that was the future of porn. And he was adamant that it was not because he thought that Cafe Flesh was hip and porn wasn't hip and that the mass audience for porn didn't want to think about style and art. They wanted to just disappear into the sex and that shot on video sex scenes. He felt like that was going to be the future uh, and not films like Cafe Flesh. And I mean, do you get a sense? I know, I, I don't know that the, um, I mean, I've seen Smoker and I, I I don't know that I've seen any of the Dark Brothers stuff. I mean, do, do you get a sense that Cafe Flesh was influential in its way or was it kind of, um, I mean, I know it was, it was kind of an outlier in, in adult, but was was there an influence that that film had? Uh I almost hate to say on the Dark Brothers because I um I know from a, a mutual friend of 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 ours, Bill, yeah. that um and I don't know that uh, I guess Gregory Dark doesn't care for having his stuff invoked <laughs> in <the next laughs> sequence. Uh, but I but I'm doing this in a way that I'm not going to take anything away. I think the Dark Brothers their their approach and it's it's mainly Gregory as far as the visuals and the writing and all that mm-hmm. is a hundred percent not like Stevens as far as like tonality as far as dialogue as far as sexuality because the Dark Brothers stuff to me is always at least what I've seen which is mainly New Wave hookers and Devil Mrs. Jones three and four um to me their approach to sexuality is like bosch like it's like seeing a hieronymus bosch painting on a lot of fucking poppers <laughs> and just like and spanish fly like it's super porny but but in an interesting way like the the use of music is great in the dark brothers um i think he does have that sense of sort of like the sense of lighting mm-hmm. You know, I definitely, especially in the hell scenes in uh, Devil Mrs. Jones 3 and 4. Also, interestingly enough, uh, a, an actor in a non-sex role in 3 and 4 is Andy Nichols, hmm. who is Maxie. Yeah. So, um, that's kind of the funny thing is Andy was also in Dr. Penetration, <laughs> which, <laughs> if I felt embarrassed about saying pussy talk, Dr. Penetration's right next to it as far as titles <laughs> where it's like, oh God. But it's actually a really fun movie. But he's also in that. And that one, I believe has a Dark Brothers connection too, but it was it's credited to Alex Dorenzi. But if you've ever wanted to see Andy Nichols in a fright wig and a wheelchair doing kind of like an amazing Doctor Strange love impersonation and see a character called the Lobster Monster, this is the movie for you. Um, yeah. I actually wanted to like kind of touch a little <laughs> bit on what you had mentioned about Blade Runner because I think that like one, like what a wider audience kind of gets to see Sadian's work with these new the new restoration of Caligari, but also hopefully the one for Cafe Flat. I think that it's going to resonate so much because of this kind of apocalyptic edge. And when you had mentioned kind of this intersection of punk music, like this is like a strange but like somewhat related tangent where Denis Villeneuve, who did 2049, which I don't necessarily want to debate, but he's from Montreal and he's from Quebec, where I'm from. And in the 1980s, he would go to the largest punk club in Montreal that still exists, which is um, Fufun Electronique. Mm-hmm. And so when he did Blade Runner 2049, he says, I was inspired not only by Blade Runner, but by the experience of watching Blade Runner and going to this punk club at that same time and kind of this intersection of both cultures. Because I think that Blade Runner, Cafe Flash are like these different sides of kind of punk in a weird way. Not saying that Ridley Scott was invoking that culture, but I think it's like kind of maybe like a mirrored into it as well because like there's definitely like a lot of transgressive elements even to that and this kind of anxiety over like the end of the world that was kind of at the brink that's so interesting yeah yeah no that's that's brilliant and I, i think especially you know you saying that, you know, because you think about, you know, with the 60s counterculture, you know, that was the the rebellion towards like sort of the 50s and, you know, just that sort of the 50s puritanism. But then like the counterculture dream died. It basically got co-opted. 
And then so you have like this younger generation that's, you know, reacting towards that and you get punk and you get, you know, and everything that's kind of tied to punk, like post punk and, all, you know, like no wave and, and all that goth and industrial. And you take somebody coming from that same sort of fertile ground who but who also like knows more about Hollywood cinema than probably anybody at TCM, which is Steven. Because his knowledge of Hollywood cinema is absolutely amazing, and it makes me feel like the biggest noob, <laughs> like ever. Because he'll he'll mention something in an interview or in a message, and I, and sometimes I know it, and sometimes I'm like, how did I miss this? It's like, oh, because I was watching, you know, le le sex qui parle. <laughs> but um. No, but that that is I love that you brought that up because I think that's the you know punk intersected in our culture in so many ways that I think people still are kind of figuring it out you know what thirty or forty years um, afterwards and you know with Cafe Flesh too um, you know having the likelihood of having like a jazz musician I mean Mitchell Froom is known for kind of being more on the jazzing end of things but I mean think about how jazz came out jazz was kind of like the rock and roll of its time when it first came out and you know what is punk but kind of the rock and roll in a way of its time too yeah well you mentioned that music and I think that that is such a big part of Cafe Flesh's effect is like that that weird like futuristic jazz electronic kind of big band thing that he does. I know that the temp track that they had for that was like music from Man with the Golden Arm and Sweet Smell of Success and like, you know, 50s kind of noirish stories and then also craft work and things like that. And the, what he comes up with for that soundtrack gives it such a this weird jaunty alien kind of quality right from the from the jump. So even before you get to the odd visual uh style and like, you know, people in rat costumes and, you know, things that are that are like kind of almost fantastic, you have this like very off kilter kind of music that's very different from what you might associate with adult film scores, you know, which you think of like, you know, boom, chicka, wow, wow, kind of like funk, or you think of things that are just um, even the way that like something like Eric Satie is used in um, Night Dreams, kind of like ironically, like you think of like uh, public domain music being used in a different way. Um, but something like Cafe Flesh, like it has an original score that's like so peculiar that it, it immediately kind of gives it a uniqueness. I forget if it comes up in the um, in the interview that you did, Justin, but does he talk about like audiences protesting it or or like demanding their money back or or just having a, a negative reaction to it? Like it didn't it didn't really go over well with the adult film audiences? No, uh, we didn't talk about that, but I find that it's such a common thread in pornography as well, that whenever you have filmmakers who kind of go outside the lines a little bit and play with irony, you always kind of have that. Um, I just watched like, I think half of Doris Wishman's filmography and she's doing a lot of the same thing as well because like all those male characters feel like she's mocking or outright contemptuous of the audience that would go to watch a Doris Wishman film. Mm -hmm. And even now it's like uh, with the response to pleasure, which uh, I have mixed feelings on, but you're seeing a similar response from the adult industry saying it's anti-porn when I think that that is also a little bit of a misreading. I think that she's doing something different than Steven is. She's advocating for more ethical porn sets and more ethical filmmaking, which hard to argue against that, but yeah. it is also a lot of the movie is talking about how the audience for these movies is difficult and a lot of the people who work in that industry kind of suck too. Um, so I don't, I think that like in a way having that kind of pushback almost speaks to how like on the money he was a little bit. And I think that in general, I don't want to make like, broad assumptions because it's not something I studied on like a sociological level. I don't actually think that the audience that goes to see porn in either renting them on VHS or going into the theaters based on my level of experience actually cares that much if they're being made fun of. Mm. <laughs> like, I, I don't <laughs> think that they actually care. Um, yeah. If they did, it's like, that's it. That's like, I don't know if that's true. I think it's more that the industry felt maybe a bit of shame uh, for like for valid reasons or otherwise. Mm. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, I do remember back in the early like 2000s reading a review online 
uh, where I had seen this movie, and it was for a, a column where it was basically sort of like WTF adult films. And like he would review stuff like the Tom Sizemore sex tape, which <laughs> I wish to God I didn't know that existed. But um, <laughs> but and he he reviewed Cafe Flesh. It was and it was an entertaining read, even though he did not he was not in for the ride. Let's put it that way. But um, but that's the thing is I think I think if somebody sees an adult film that gives them something, even if they hate Cafe Flesh, they can't say it's what they expected. Because mm-hmm. usually if if somebody you know especially you know, with, like, where the direction the genre kind of went, it quickly became just sort of almost, like, a reductive. Like, the the seeds of adult films were stag loops, where it's really minimal plot and basically just sex, just straight on sex. And especially as digital, you know, happens and the internet happens, it's kind of, like, gone back to that. Now, I do know um, there are people, I think, in the industry now that are going back to making sort of plot-based films, which is really cool. And, you know, I'd love to see, you know... Because I think there's a lot you can do with it. Um, it's it's probably a very uphill battle, though. I imagine even more so now than it was then. But uh, I, I know I know quite a bit about this. Oh, um, it's- <laughs> I uh, I I write porn, so I write. Oh, some fabulous! Of them, but uh, I write most of what I write is like the shittiest of the shitty. Like mm-hmm. um, the faux incest is huge, and I want it to die so desperately. I hate it. Um, but there are definitely one. There's studios that do it for just like Netflix and Amazon. There is an element of prestige if you could win awards and kind of break into the mainstream. Two, a lot of parody or comedy porn do really well still on DVD because they're bought by frat houses and bachelor parties and people who want to rent a porn that is not going to make them too uncomfortable because they kind of have that pretense of laughing at and or with it. Mm -hmm. And three, I do think that a lot of the people who are getting into porn now, because there's this intersection of culture where a lot of these performers and also filmmakers come from a more cinema background, partially because of the way that culture has kind of just melded everything, like Tumblr and all of these different sites where a lot of them do have artistic aspirations. So there is a little bit of money there, but it's like, I don't think that we're ever going to return to a kind of golden age because I just don't see a mainstream return uh, on that level. But there clearly is still money and an audience in it. Uh, And I'm, I'm very fascinated by like how far it can be taken. And I've definitely spoken to some directors who have aspirations to create pornography that will play at like a film festival because they're like, well, why not? Like, it's art. I'm making something with a story. If I have to edit a version without uh, hardcore sex and it still stands up, like, it still stands up. So I I think that it'll be interesting to see if, like, it continues down that way because Mm -hmm. pornography also changes so drastically so quickly. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. And now it's funny because I actually follow um, a photographer named uh, I think her her nom de porn which is a, a sentence I love saying uh, is Stella Smut but she is super cool and her visuals I know she's assisted a lot for Holly Randall and um, who's also a really talented like photographer and videographer and Stella has a lot of the same influences that I find a lot of people like us that are into cult film and genre film too and I, when I see stuff like that I'm like oh that's exciting you know because it's you know let's blur the lines because I mm-hmm. in fact I've I remember um like a, a was it Eric I think it was Eric Edwards also known as Rob Everett who's like one of the legends of male actors in the golden age and like I mean he made some crack about when um all that buzz about um that uh Oh God! Why am I blanking on this one? The uh, nymphoman is it nymphomania? Nymphomaniac. Yes, the lar- uh, Yeah, I love that. That's what I blank on. I can remember the sex key part. <laughs> 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 but Lars von Trier film, I'm like, what? But uh, but yeah, I mean, like Eric Edwards was like, you know, just like, you know, whatever, you know, my my era, we, you know, you didn't have to digitally add anything. We had sex for real and did dialogue and did good performances and acting. And he he's 100 percent right. So I that's exciting to hear though, Justine. I'd love that. I think too. Uh, there's um, she. I think she used to be a performer. I could be wrong, but Erica Lust also has often open calls for people mm-hmm. to pitch. Probably 
projects, particularly people who like this is the thing. It's like the mainstream pornography is still very much dominated by like the most whitewashed heteronormative stuff imaginable, which is always mm-hmm. going to be a little bit limiting, I think, and actually creative something interesting, transgressive. But Erica Lust is like trying to commission people who are kind of like anything. Like if you want to do something really out there, really wild. I think more in the short and medium length of pornography kind of area. But I think it's like, there's definitely a lot of promise there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, kind of talking about like, how do we preserve this porn culture? I've definitely been exposed to or seen like a lot of like, individual performers who have an incredible eye or an incredible sense of irony who are self producing works that is incredible is very funny or very audacious or very ironic but it's on only fans or it's being posted mm. on like their own website and it's like that stuff disappears like sometimes it, it becomes ethically complex particularly for women or people who it's like oh i want to move on from that side of my career and maybe i don't want that to exist or i don't want that to be exposed anymore so it's definitely like a very interesting question about like finding like a, the right balance for the future of pornography yeah yeah especially i don't know it'd be nice to have our culture shift in a way where people wouldn't have to be you know like ashamed certainly mm-hmm. i mean I had, I had a friend of mine who was a brilliant writer but he had a, a brief career in adult in the 80s and you know he would sometimes feel haunted and it's not that he himself i think felt bad about what he did but it's like he would have other people in his life and I just remember telling him but like if the worst thing you did was have consenting sex with an adult I don't think it's that bad <laughs> you know like we live in a world full of war and you know yeah. rampant abuse and you know all kinds of truly awful things like consenting sex between adults is something nobody should ever be shamed you know certainly shamed for and especially if it's in a film like Cafe Flash which uh, which that's the, uh, the, other, the other interesting thing is that you have two leads who are basically not in the action because Michelle Bauer as Pia Snow uses a body double which I know some people have contested it but I've watched that film enough to where it's like I'm pretty sure that's a body double (laughs) which makes me sound really super creepy now that I'm saying that out loud sorry (laughs) she's a great actress though and Paul McGivney um and Paul's a really um I got to interview him years ago really super nice guy from Louisiana he actually was a radio DJ at one point which I think is pretty pretty cool and um and it was a close set because actually Paul made a joke about trying to pee on what in one of the scenes so they were like kid yeah <laughs> you gotta get kid you're not involved in this so watching this again i was thinking about because i just had a conversation a few weeks ago with somebody about the uh the dreaded term elevated horror the uh whatever you would call like the kind of the, the new wave of art house horror films and i thought about how if cafe flesh came out now and had the reception now i could see someone trying to mark it as elevated porn because it is kind of porn for people that don't normally like to watch porn it, i mean it's something that has its origins i guess they they shot an r-rated film and then added the hardcore core to it when the producers or the financiers insisted on being a triple X film, but mm. there was an HBO R-rated cut of it that I guess got some cable play, although I don't know, I mean, too much about, I don't know how widely it played, but I know that there was a, an R-rated cut of it, but it's like, and when we talk about it being uh, a film that you can interpret as being kind of contemptuous of, of the porn world, and it has like these pretensions towards something more artistic, which I think it succeeds at. I'm not saying that like pretension, like a bad thing, but like that, it, but it, but it's something that you can see why it stands apart from other adult films in a way that like, if, if you're only going to watch a handful of adult films, like this is one that would make sense to art house people and that it found its audience as a midnight movie, not as a, um, an adult movie, the way that maybe night dreams did. I don't know. I mean, do you, do you see it as, um, I mean, I don't know if you'd agree or not, but I mean, because I, I, I think about like golden age adult film seems to find increasing, um, I don't know about respect, but it seems to be more visible through like labels like Vinegar Syndrome and and mm-hmm. Picks and like like um, certain films are kind of at least being seen in context and in history. I mean, whether it be Devil and Miss Jones or the Radley Metzger films or... Mm-hmm. I guess it will be the case with Cafe Flesh, which has always kind of stood outside it a little bit. But I don't see that same respect carrying over to later generations. Like, I don't know that Sasha Gray or Jenna Jameson are, are treated maybe as respectfully as like the, uh, you know, the Demiano, you know, the behind the green door, like things that like are shot on 35 millimeter and like played in theaters yeah. and like have that mm-hmm. kind of distance. Like it's, it still feels like adult film is continues to be ghettoized 
but like the older films, maybe because there's that detached, like because maybe people who watch grew up with Boogie Nights or something, they feel like, oh, well, that part of porn history is okay now bring into the fold. But from video on, um, it's something else, something we don't respect. But what you're describing as far as like there being an underground of, of new adult work that wants to play festivals, maybe, maybe that's changing. I mean, that's that was just my perception of it. It felt yeah. like the older films were even like someone like Fred Halstead, like, you know, or Wakefield Pool, like even like gay hardcore is like getting some kind of begrudging respect, but it feels like um, new adult work is still very much in its own little universe. It doesn't seem like it overlaps with film festival cinephile culture. I I think it's like an oversaturation. And I think it's very difficult to compare the eras just because like now the like the sheer volume of pornography that is being produced makes it incredibly difficult for anyone to parse through it compared to even like like there was always a high volume of porn being made to a certain extent but like it's like now it's like it's astronomical and i do agree though that there's kind of this this almost prudishness where it's like people will kind of start to appreciate porn of the past starting even to go into the 90s now like i think it's like it's far enough that you would kind of have this new appreciation but it becomes still very difficult for anybody to kind of assess more contemporary pornography i don't know if that's because it lacks more general artistry because kind of what you're invoking like 35 millimeter there was a lot more money put into productions as well mm-hmm. there just isn't as much money in making is volume quality doesn't count as much as quantity does now mm. because people want more and what they want from performers is not art necessarily they want volume like from my point of view just because it's like something that interests me and kind of even talking about like Stephen's like lost theater work what's so interesting about theater as an art form is it's like you kind of have to be there and it doesn't matter even if it's a play that's recorded part of it is being in that physical space and I think what's underappreciated about pornography in general is that it's also about a physical bodies and physical space and so I think that we're going to start to probably see kind of an assessment of performers right now kind of people like Sasha Gray partially because she kind of had a bridge over into to, like art house cinema through Soderbergh and she's also does stuff on Twitch all the time and kind of managed to kind of break into the mainstream that what she's doing with her body is such a like incredible performance like it's like it's hard to put it into like words and context because like is it theater is it performance art is it dancing it's kind of all of those things and I kind of see too like in even like before he was making movies like the the kind of satirical or ironic spreads that like Stephen was doing with Hustler, like the these bodies that were being deconstructed, like so much of it, there was a lot of violence and there was a lot of also like associating bodies, uh, like his, uh, I, I, I can't remember the names, but like the, the spread that was just those chickens, the chicken one. <laughs> oh God, yeah, the yeah. chicken. Yes. Yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> and it's like, it's kind of understanding. It's like the body is both the product in that world but it is also the primary um expression of the art form and like i think stevens reads so much like as an artistic director there's so much music the dialogue all of these things but fundamentally it's like the body itself is like the centerpiece of what those films are because if they weren't it would not be on this kind of border of art and porn because it would not it wouldn't be the kind of port- pornographic transgression what one just person i wanted to mention real quick um we don't have to talk about him at length, but is Jerry Stahl and um, mm. who is somebody that like I, it blew my mind to realize that he was the the writer behind these films with Steven Sadian because I I knew him from Permanent Midnight and like this kind of you know brilliant junky writer that like wrote Alf and like got fired from Twin Peaks and like you know was like this character and you know kind of a big name and this journalist and. I think that he's such a, an integral part to like what makes these films so funny because I guess he does rewrites on Sadian's scripts to uh, just add more jokes because they are so brilliantly written as like as far mm. as the writing, especially Dr. Caligari. But when I think about him, I think about drugs because I think about like his Permanent Midnight being my introduction to who he was. And um, Cafe Flesh is so funny because it is like a, a drug movie in disguise. Mm-hmm. Like they don't, I mean, I mean, barely in disguise. I mean, all the, the language of it is like evoking drug addiction. But 
but but mm-hmm. but putting that on the audience for these movies. Well, I'd even have that shot where uh, Max talks about you know your hunger is my need, and he mimes like wrapping yeah like a tourniquet around his wrist to you know get a fix. Um, yeah, no, that's that's something I've always really admired. Stephen is such a generous like partner. Like, because, you know, and that's thing I picked up definitely in your interview, just seen with him, was that, like, he is somebody that works with so many great people. Like, he's like a lightning rod that attracts equally really talented, amazing people. Like, Jerry's number one. But, I mean, of course, you have Lottie Vanyansky, who, you know, Stephen worked with, you know, as a photographer at Hustler. I think he lends Calgary. Uh, he also did the photography for Frank Zappa's Thankfish uh, cover, which Stephen did the art direction for. Of course, Mitchell Froom. And, and the thing about Stahl that I find really cool, too, is that Stahl's collaboration goes into, like, the video era. Because Jerry worked with them on Party Gall, a go-go one and two. Well, he's, uh, they're apparently still working together. Because mm-hmm. I know that, like, uh steven and jerry may have a script that they've been working on and like that's like that collaboration if you kind of put it down in years lasts longer than most relationships most marriages oh. uh <laughs> to- totally and, <laughs> um because it's like jerry Stull was also also wrote a lot of copy for his hustlers like so mm-hmm. like i think if you look at the again like names escape me but the one that's like the tribute to like american culture like all of the writing is done by jerry Stahl, and it's like it's always like again kind of strange poetry that mm-hmm. is so so out there and so like i find so beautiful and even though it's like this kind of touch of ugliness. Oh, totally. It's just always that that ability to go really dark, but never in a way that there, there's just enough wit and charm to where it doesn't totally just make you want to go like, you know, watch a Lars von Trier film that you'll forget the name of in a <laughs> podcast. But but yeah, I mean, they both really do have that, that ability. And Jerry is like such a great writer. And I want to say that the name, because I know it had a name change. I want to say the script is called, they're working on right now, it's called Hell is Tender. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's exciting. I definitely am hoping that all of the film gods and goddesses work together because having a new Stephen Sadian film, I mean, that would make going through this whole pandemic and all of this complete inanity and insanity <laughs> that is this planet a little bit better for sure so um but uh before we go to calgary though one thing um i'd love to get both of your perspectives on with cafe flesh is um something that really hit me strong while working uh on the chapter about it for the the book project is that you know it's initially easy to see max melodramatic as the villain of the piece because and it's such a brilliant performance by andy because at times he's almost like a hyena he just really lashes out at the audience particularly at nick and of course but then he's revealed to have some humanity because he's at one point humiliated by the owner for being too mean to Nick. And you basically find out that he's neither a sex negative or a positive. He basically was literally emasculated due to nuclear effects. But I feel like one dark take I really got from the film is that the ultimate sort of villain is is the world around us. It's the the powers that be that put everybody in this situation in the first place. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know. What do you what 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 were your what were your takeaways I, of Cafe Flesh as far as that goes? I, I think I see it that way too. I never thought of any mm. of the characters as being especially villainous. I mean, some of them are maybe more selfish, but they're all like in this very traumatic kind of environment. That I don't really mm-hmm. see even even Max Melodramatic as especially like a heavy. Like I think of him as just being a comedian <laughs> comedians are mm-hmm. mean <laughs> you know so I, I i never even thought of him as being like yeah i mean i i think that there's something kind of sad about the way that the the young girl in town is like i mean they, they played all as sex fantasy as far as like she enjoys being a performer like right from the get-go like but like you know the fact that they're like essentially like kidnapping this version and throwing her into like a sex show could be played for like total horror in another context <laughs> and I, the fact that, that they play it as part of the um the fantasy i mean I, in that way it does feel like it's not completely anti the, the conventions of porn where you know I mean, as far as like it doesn't it doesn't play up like if that were a real situation how that might feel emotionally but i don't think of any of the characters as as the villains i i think it's just it's a grim reality but i think that it's ultimately i, I mean when I, I know that the original ending of it was actually quite dark there was one version that they wrote they never shot where like nick hangs himself at the end like, like over the stage i believe yeah yeah and another where he essentially castrates himself it's like there was like a much bleaker ending hmm. or two that they came up with but 
it ends without it going that far. But I mean, I guess the original concept for Cafe Flesh was a little bleaker than what we have. I don't know. I mean, what do you, what do you think, Justine? I mean, I think going back to what I had mentioned that I think post pandemic, I mean, this movie is obviously about atomic fears, which have also returned somewhat uh, over the past six months. But I think it could easily be seen as like this cataclysmic event that thrusts everybody into a situation of uncertainty uh, an invisible threat as well, this kind of like, especially in the early stages of the pandemic, where it's like a lot of people started to even be unsure of like, am I healthy? Like what's going on? And the way that it, those kind of situations turn people not necessarily into the worst version of themselves, but there's a lot of questionable statements or questionable acts that kind of emerge out of that kind of anxiety that I wouldn't, I'd like, I, I don't want to like make it like talking about the movie in particular, it's like, People are acting out of self-defense in a way, and sometimes that self-defense is to protect the ego. Sometimes it's to protect status. Sometimes it's just as a way of surviving within a new ecosystem that privileges some over others, and people will behave badly. But if you remove them from that context, are they necessarily evil or bad? I don't necessarily think so. And I think talking about like the influences of film noir, I think film noir is also so much about that. They're characters who I don't think... There are many, quote unquote, evil people in noir. I think it's a lot of people in complex social, cultural and political situations who have adapted ways to survive that are often self-serving because they've been betrayed by the government. They've been betrayed by the people that they love or they've been betrayed on some level, rational or irrational. And so they act out. And I think that that is kind of what the, the Cafe Flesh is really tapping into, which I think is why it's so so cool and so interesting and continues, I think, to be so relevant. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, one thing that's really exciting about this restoration that Daniel's getting together, too, is that this will be the first time, uh, to my knowledge, this film will be available uncut on any sort of um, physical format because the VCX print is cut which is pretty obvious to tell if you have the Mitchell Froom soundtrack, because there's that whole um, skull in the cage monologue that Max does. That's absolutely utterly brilliant. It's one of my favorite things in the movie. And you hear the whole dialogue and the soundtrack, but it's not in the, not in the cut that you'll have. Hmm. And I was, and I'm like, why did they, that's sort of the inane thing about like how companies, not, not all companies. Cause like Bill, you mentioned earlier, Distripix. Distripix is a company that has its roots going back to the sixties where they released like sexploitation films. Hmm. And then later on did adult films. And that company has always taken really good care of their library and still does to this day. Like we have those beautiful Radley Metzger releases at, or the Henry Paris films, thanks to Distripix. So, but for every Mr. Picks, you have two or three that really have kind of wet the bat on that. And, and what's weird is that it wasn't unusual for certain films to be censored in the 80s and 90s on home video because of uh, like Mies Commission type stuff. Like if there's bondage, if there's like water sports, if there's rape, any sort of those themes tend to get cut. But none of that's in any of Steven's films, you know, and the stuff that got cut out of uh, Cafe Flesh is not, and especially the Skull in the Cage sequence, like, it's, like, you see a girl kind of wiggling around in the uncut section, like, she's kind of tied, but she's not even having sex. In fact, I, th I think if I remember it, she's just topless. She's not even, I mean, she's, like, it, it's, that's just how ridiculous and stupid, like, the censorship. Well, censorship is always stupid <laughs> and ridiculous, but, um, you know, or you have a film like Raw Talent that is still unavailable, uncut, because there's a, a fight scene that has no sex. You know, this is the lowest common denominator of what can happen when adults are treated like children. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. uh, I mean, that's one of the things, too. It's like based on like my experience right in porn is like even when you're do you are writing these like more feature films, like we can't have blood in the movies, for example, even outside mm -hmm. of the sex, mm -hmm. because it becomes very like the rules written or unwritten are so people are really afraid to kind of break them because there are actually like huge financial consequences uh, because the I mean, you have like you, I, you, you start to see that like even like outside of like going out there just by the way that like Visa and MasterCard, which have such so much control over porn, mm. um, yeah. can just shut you down. And a lot of times, like they have a lot of power over what gets produced and not produced, and the people with the money don't want to cross them. Uh, I, and again, I want to say this like all with the irony that the number one porn right now is fake incest, and MasterCard is okay with that, but they're not okay with like a little bit of blood here and there. 
Oh, God. Is it that whole, like, step yeah. sibling craze? No, I actually, I listened to Holly Randall's podcast, and even she, like, I've seen, like, everybody that works in the industry are like, oh, God, please, would somebody get into something different? We are so done with this, like, step-dad, stepmother thing. It's the worst. And, like, I, I don't know how true this is, but I read this article by, like, a data scientist who basically explained the way that it became the number one porn trend which is because of a very like a, I don't know how algorithms work but this a very small audience watches a huge percentage of porn so it's like five percent of the audience is watching like 25 percent of the porn and that five percent is watching so much porn and like it's like it sounds like a cliche but apparently it's true that's like mm-hmm. if you watch a lot of porn you need more extreme porn to get off and so they drove it towards the faux incest and because the algorithm was supporting that it became a thing but now it becomes, what do you call it, like an Orosporos, where it started as niche. And then this very small audience boosted it up because of algorithm numbers. And then because the wider audience gets exposed to it, they just start watching it too. And it becomes like a vicious cycle. But it's the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst to watch. I think it's, I think it's gross. I just think it's gross. It's totally it's so stupid. Because it's like, there's, you have to say stuff like, you have to say, I know all the rules. So the rules are, you have to say that there's step. It can never be an adoption situation. They, uh, if it's a parent and a child, they could not have known each other before the child was under 18. They also can only be in a step situation of any kind, step brother, step parent. For, they have to know each other for two years or less uh, and you have to <laughs> mention all like you have to put all of this in dialogue and depending on the studio sometimes you have to repeat it several times <laughs> and so it's like oh even God. from the point of view of like the performers they have to be like I can't believe I met you at my 19th birthday party <laughs> six months ago because like you have to say it like it's like it sounds so stupid but like you have to say it and I like tried to get around it once or twice by saying like, oh, I like I met in college and they're like, oh, it's college is too ambiguous or like second year of college is too ambiguous. You have to say age. You have to say like we were 20. Oh, geez. This. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. Oh, my God. Well, thanks a lot. The 5 percent of of people that need to get better hobbies and watching that much pornography jesus also yeah yeah, as somebody who has like step family no it's gross i don't ew i just really i'm not trying to kink shame anybody but oh i can't i cannot do i cannot deal with it (laughs) it's funny we talk about censorship with triple x films and i think that um the one adult film that we know of that Wes Craven directed under the name Abe Snake is the Fireworks Woman. And um, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that that's a film that has multiple cuts because of censorship. And I even think that the um, incest theme in that is changed in the dialogue in some versions of it to remove the incest element. But I mean, that's a film that I don't think it has any like complete version circulation. But yeah, I mean, that incest thing was something that I guess was being used in porn even back in, in that time. Yeah. I mean, maybe oh, that is oh, trendy. The 70s did not give a shit. Are you kidding? Yeah. Pretty Peaches? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Pretty Peaches, Justine? No. Oh, oh my. That's on They Have a Vinegar Syndrome. They do, and it's yeah. gorgeous. It's a yeah. gorgeous restoration. Yeah, that film, it's like a 30 screwball comedy on acid. It is nuts. Like, That's there's a. Amazing. It's, oh, you'll love it. It's really, I love the film and it's classic Dorenzi. Like, Alex Dorenzi is such a great director of just having things in his films where you're like, what is going on? I do too. And like, (laughs) also, I really recommend his movie Little Sisters, uh, especially because it actually has the coquettes in it. Um, Like, it, it has, it's one of those rare hetero films that has like actual like has gay sex in it too like it's a truly bisexual film which was really rare in the 70s like that was not too common so yeah i watched an alex Dorenzi film uh this week that steven sadan is like apparently a, a writer on it um moving in oh my god that's on my list i have not seen it and uh i mean but i was looking for evidence of sadan as a writer and i i couldn't really detect it it doesn't feel like it is the same kind of dialogue as like the things he writes with jerry Stahl. but there is a scene where ron jeremy opens up a package and nina hartley jumps out like a jack-in-the-box that feels like like another nod to that jack-in-the-box imagery from <laughs> 
<laughs> from Night Dreams, but that's the extent of it. Otherwise, it feels just like a very, you know, pervy situation comedy kind of setup. It's just, you know, neighbors and their swingers. And it's not that ambitious mm. or strange, but like that one moment, I'm like, oh, well, that's probably something that he came up with. I would have loved it if she jumped back in the box, but she jumps out. It's Ron Jeremy. And she goes, that would, that would be more like Night Dreams. She back in the box. Yeah, yeah that would. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's that's kind of like the. F- it's almost like with some of the stuff, like with the music video stuff, because Francis D'Elia directed a lot of music videos, and some of them you can definitely tell it's the era where it's him and Steven. Like some more explicitly than others, like the Wall of Voodoo, the video for the Ramones Psychotherapy is clearly uh, Steven is all over it, right down to like the main guy in it is Robert Dennis, who's the enforcer in Cafe Flesh. Yeah. So and then like there's others where I'm kind of curious, like I think Steven might be like. Like, Dalia did Rockwell, Somebody's Watching Me, which is very spooky and has some cool kind of shadowy imagery, so that could be. And the Oyster Cult Shooting Shark has a lot of surrealism and some really great, like, just kind of like, there's a great kind of hobo wino character who at one point is like a mystic. And that's really cool. Because then, like, but then Dalia would direct stuff like Sarah by Jefferson. Or what? No, it wasn't even Jefferson Starship, but Starship. Yeah. Which is like Dust Bowl M-O-R. It's not, I would not recommend it. Yeah, but, didn't he do so, We Built This City? <laughs> No, oh god, he probably. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Though, yeah, it's weird. There's a, a Starship video that has the residents in a cameo, which I find very bizarre. But that's that's an aside. Well, before um, we get to Dr. Caligari, you wanted to talk mm-hmm. about the the video work. I know that um, that the uh, the Do It Again video with Brian yes. Wilson is that the same sets or the same? It's yes, and right down to even the same sort of like um, like keen doll mask that you see in Caligari at one point, where it's like the large eyes that's in you know the sets are the same it has the complete aesthetic at one point you even see like that contraption that calgary puts mr van houten in where he's almost like um sort of like a party clown that's in bondage i don't know how else to describe that you guys know what i'm talking yeah about. i don't know how you describe that with the rough collar like the hot pink rough collar um where you see Chaz t gray in a similar situation except it involves tennis balls it's a fantastic video and the fact that they got brian wilson to appear yeah this music yeah you know, it's it's it just adds to the surrealism um and there's also the still from that videos the album cover for happy planet that wall of voodoo album yeah it's it's so great and wall of voodoo are such an underrated band i'm glad that he did that video too because that era that band had two distinct eras and that era stan bridgeway who was the original lead singer is out and have andy pretty boy but andy pretty boy is equally brilliant very a very different animal that era of the band's great and so i just i love that those intersect as well and uh i'm definitely i would i'm hoping that there can be some you know some because some of the members are still with us most of them i know bruce morland is still with us and he worked on that set of the film and he's still like out there doing music and stuff under the name ravens morland so yeah well you were saying that dr caligari which we should talk about that that has um like you you were talking about like the intersection between the music world and the film world as far as like the the people involved in it i know that has there's a few musicians in the cast and do you want to talk a little bit about this film and like, I mean, just where it falls in his career? Because like, it's it's a break from from hardcore. The premise of this is because it's, you know, the title, you think it's going to be a remake of The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And it's really, to my mind, almost closer to a uh, a riff on Night Dreams. I mean, right down to the characters and, mm-hmm. and Mrs. Van Houten. And, you know, again, she's being studied by, uh, by a doctor doing kind of experiments. And it's all an excuse to have like a series of unusual kind of uh, set pieces like it doesn't feel like it's i'm trying to remember i haven't seen the cabinet of dr caligari in a little while but i don't think that there's very much overlap in terms of their stories am i i mean other than just like their um, creative sets well i know it's like when i was speaking with steven like for him i think he kind of pushes this story this narrative that the title is kind of imposed after the fact because mm. it's a way to sell the movie but i do think there are comparisons but like in a very like spiritual rather than a literal sense um and i kind of even see like in night dreams like these kind of echoes of Caligari but the comparisons that I see is like Caligari is a weird movie shot entirely on these like incredibly abstract sets 
which is something that like is singular as the cabinet of Dr. Caligari from the 1920s. Like no one else was really doing it on the scale that they were and the kind of extreme imagery. And then you have Stephen Sadian, who is one of the only people who's doing that on that kind of extreme level in, I would say, like the past 30 years in American cinema in that sense that they're comparable. And two, I think the kind of treatment of these female characters is also kind of interesting. I think Stephen is much more invested in that internal world of this woman trapped in this dream not dream like world and kind of being a victim but also possibly being liberated there's like there's like a lot of ambiguities there as to who's the one who's dreaming type of situation which again I think is amplified a little bit more in night dreams than it is in Dr. Caligari but I do agree that they're very interconnected and also this presence of like these doctors not doctors because that's also a theme in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari which if you kind of even look at that historical context right uh, uh, you're talking about a situation of like rising um, off of authoritarianism post-war a lot of anxiety over the future of Germany and I think that you could kind of see a lot of the similar themes in American society at that time. I'm not trying to say that like there was a comparable rise of Nazism in the United States in the late 80s, but I do think that there were similar fears of your superpower as Germany was in World War I. And there's a sense of deep disillusionment that's been happening, kind of talking about the failure of the countercultural movement. So you have one part of society that had this hope, this baby boomers, like we could have changed the world and it just failed and got co-opted by corporations. You have the presence of Ronald Reagan, who was kind of a mess, then the following up with George Bush, another kind of mess. Oh, and so how do you kind of cope with that society? And especially when you're kind of being flooded with propaganda and propaganda of corporatism, cor- propaganda of illusions, propaganda of the American dream. And I think that Dr. Caligari is a very clever play on that and a clever response to that, again, in the same way that the one from the 1920s was, although the one from the 20s was not as funny. Um, I think... <laughs> That's something that's, that's <laughs> Stephen really brought to the table. <laughs> no, I've God, I love all of that. I mean, it's it is kind of it is technically, I guess you'd call it maybe kind of a very loose sequel because she basically she's the granddaughter or the great granddaughter, yeah. and has his has. I love the shot where you reveal that she has the brain. <laughs> she still has his brain in a jar, which is like such feels like such a great like 1950s science fiction kind of throwback. And like the casting in this film, like Madeline Renault as the the Titra Calgary because she's almost like a leggy like supermodel fusion of like if you took like Linda Evangelista Werner Krauss and Conrad Veidt and put them in a martini shaker and like out comes this beautiful like amazing woman she's she's so great and it's funny with Laura Albert as um, Mrs. Van Houten it, it initially took me a while to warm up to it because I was so I just thought Dorothy LeMay was so and I still do but over the years it's like no nah, Laura Albert it's fantastic in this and especially because she you know we get to see her not only play Van Houten but then like you know um, when Caligari starts really going heavy in her experiments and switches basically through the use of what is it like the fluid from the hypothalamus from like Gus Van Prant who's like an Albert Fish type serial killer and god he's great too like we get the words juice dog I actually this is like this is kind of embarrassing I used to write the word juice dog on my sneakers in the early because I just love that phrase so much it's just um but she basically so you have Laura Albert running around talking like a cannibal and reading the joy of cooking Cooking and you know, talking about like mountain oyster recipes and how to cook testicles properly, um, which is phenomenal. <laughs> and uh, oh god! And actually, something that hit me: there's two. Um, I know there's a third musician I've forgotten because I remember um, I, Stephen corrected me one time because I remembered uh, Maggie uh, Shaco, who was a singer who did the song for um, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, or that's featured heavily. And Texacala Jones, who was in Tex and the Horse Heads, and she's also in um, Allison Anders Border Radio. Oh, yeah. So there's all kinds of cool, kind of weird cult film ties here, but I can't remember. I'm sure as soon as we get done recording, it'll hit me and I'll feel like a, a complete dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Midnight Movie still technically existed in 1989, but it feels like 
when I think of that film, I think of the video store cult sections. I mean, uh, although I know, oh, yeah. it did, I, I know it did play theatrically, like in, uh, was it the New Art? I'm trying to think which theater it played for a while at one of them. I believe so. It also got like, there's that great ad that MTV ran, mm. which you can find on YouTube, which, God, that's, can you imagine, like, especially 1989 era music, like MTV, where they're showing like, I don't know, like a Whitney Houston video or something or Firehouse. <laughs> and then like, all of a sudden there's this Chris Connolly's talking about Dr. Calcari. <laughs> like it's so great no this is a really fascinating it, it's still got some of the sexual elements um and it's really kind of cool to compare it to night dreams because obviously you have some continual themes um and even there's some continual imagery that you see in cafe flesh because like you see like mr van Houten at one point's in kind of a weird sort of angular geometric shaped box that he's peeking out of and, and you know, of course, the climax, you see that, too, with the role reversal with uh, Mrs. Van Houten and Dr. Calgary. And, you know, in Cafe Flesh, you have the set piece where there's like a woman in a box. I think there's even like a woman in the bar under the bar, like where Bosco is in Cafe Flesh. And then the whole scene of um, where things are slowed down and you're flanked by the asylum people. And it's very kind of creepy and very car- almost like Carnival Souls like and you have that in Cafe Flesh except the flip is that with Cafe Flesh Max is beckoning Lana to basically all but out herself as a posse whereas you know in Calgary it's you know Dr. Aval's daughter being beckoned to by her husband to rescue her and get them out of there so so it's definitely a lighter <laughs> A much lighter film um like with calgary and especially having the music video i'm i feel like it should have been way bigger i mean it did good it did damn good especially given you know the limited budget and cult films you know in general at this era because you're right the midnight movie still kind of existed but it's 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 dying out especially compared to like the era of the 70s where you had rocky horror and el topo and you know jack smith of course that's more 60s but um but yeah i mean but it i mean he got that great article in film threat it did good what's interesting there's actually a reference to the film threat magazine and night dreams too which i loved <laughs> yeah yeah I, I you and i have talked about straight to hell the alex cox film mm. on a podcast and i was thinking about that watching this again because of fox harris and i'm trying to think are there other shared cast members with the alex cox films uh yes jennifer balgobin that's right who plays dr Aval's daughter she's um she's the wife that like washes the motorcycle seductively in straight to hell okay yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and gets yelled at by her husband <laughs> he's like you call that clean <laughs> Um, Abby Wool, I believe, has also worked behind the scenes on both films. And I feel like, um, I'm blanking, I feel like there's another connection to Calgary and Straight to Hell. But um, as far as musicians, though, you do have uh, Maggie Song, who's one of the patients. Um, and she was in the Fibonacci's, which did the theme song for Terror Vision. Yeah. How great is that? That's pretty great. That's... And you have, you have Jennifer Miro <laughs> from The Nuns doing the chinchilla, chinchilla. I remember the first time I saw it thinking that it was like, a film that was all dream sequence like even if they were dream sequences within it like when you got out of the dream you were still in like a dreamscape like there's no there's no reality to it this it's all artificial and it's all stylized um the entire time which i remember hearing you talk about this film on the projection booth a few years ago heather and you mentioned Mm -hmm. how it was a um like a brave choice to not have any kind of every man or every woman surrogate characters in a film like this. Like everybody is a little bit um, like you're observing everybody. Like nobody is your, what's the word I'm looking for? Your proxy or your, your your surrogate character. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that idea with this one? Absolutely. Especially because um, that was so long ago, it'll feel like a fresh idea <laughs> that I'm talking about. But uh, no, I mean, seriously, that is something um, that's, I think, one of the factors that does make this film a very unusual viewing, especially for any first time viewer, is because there is truly nothing sort of rooted in what I think most cinema people would expect to see in a film. Especially, I would love to have like a friend who's pretty straight and have them watch this and be like, if they're used to Marvel movies or whatever, you know, they have that Disney Plus subscription. And again, not shaming. Life is short. If you if that brings you happiness, beautiful. But to take somebody who's been weaned on that and make them watch Cal- Dr. Calgary would be just like kind of transcendent. But yeah, I mean, there's nothing. It's not a film really rooted in the modern earthly realm in the sense of like traditional storytelling and traditional cinematic storytelling but that's part of like why it's i think so fascinating and great and 
And the fact that, like, kind of a cool twist with it, and I don't know, I, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this in that episode, I kind of doubt I did, is that in Night Dreams, you have the great spoiler that Van Houten, who you think has been studied and basically like a sexual lab rat this whole time, is really the puppet master. And it's almost like the doctors and the end of that are almost like in some kind of, you know, Sartre no exit like situation, and which is such a weird ending and such a great ending because you're like, whoa, okay, that was unexpected. And here you don't have that. But Van Houten is like, she's the one with enough wherewithal to still be able to turn the tables on the doctor and ultimately become the puppet master. But yeah, I mean, this is, um, I do like that Mr. Van Houten is represented here, which he is in a night dreams. And I'm blanking on that actor's name, but he's really great. I mean, I think most of the actors here really handle the dialogue fantastically with Fox Harris being the king, um, a delight in everything. You mentioned Straight to Hell, like, which I've just seen. Have you seen Straight to Hell? Oh my god, girl, you need to see it. Fox Harris, it has the Pogues in it and like 8 million other, like Grace Jones is in it for two minutes. And Joe Strummer's like one of the leads. But Fox Harris plays a lounge singer from Las Vegas. And he has like this fake wig and this mustache. And he sings Tom Jones's Delilah. Oh my god. Yes, it will, you will feel like it's your birthday when you see it. (laughs) It's like, it's one of the most joy bringing things. And um, God, if I had a time machine, knowing that Fox worked with Steven on the stage. Like, I mean, just to see anything Steven did for the stage in general would be like a gift, especially with him. And John Durbin, who's Gus Pratt, I know worked with Steven on that. And John Durbin's great. And he's an actor that I think is talked about even less than Fox. But um, I think most people know him. He's one of the zombies in Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. I want to say he's the one that either is either asking for more cops or for send more paramedics. He's one of those zombies, <laughs> but he's he's fantastic here as the uh, cannibalistic Gus Pratt who puts pins and needles in his talks, which, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, I love how the gore is handled. There's a lot of body horror in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that, um, just the, the, the ankle wounds and whatever do feel like something from like a seventies body horror, like something you could imagine Cronenberg, or even early David Lynch, you know, having imagery like that, but yeah, it's, mm-hmm. but done in this bright garish color palette. It doesn't feel like those seventies body horror films at all. It feels like, um, I know that, um, when Mike White talked about it on Projection Booth, like he made comparison, maybe it was because of the the doors and things, but he made a comparison to Beetlejuice. And I, I do think that if you were like trying to sell this to a to a newbie, as far as like points of reference, you could maybe compare some of the more outrageous stylized otherworldly sequences in Beetlejuice to something like as a point of reference for like mm-hmm. um, visual idea. But the writing is certainly not like Tim Burton movie, <laughs> but uh <laughs> I remember the first time I saw it thinking like, because it opens with something like a good seven to eight minutes of silence sequence before any dialogue even kicks in. I thought, is the whole film going to be a silent film? Well, the first time I saw it, I was and then shocked when it becomes almost like like a Hal Hartley movie or something as far as like how... <laughs> how stylized all of the patter is in it. But uh, do you have any other things you want to say about Dr. Caligari? Oh, God, the camera work. Yeah. Like the way, um, and I I believe Steven mentioned, and Justine, I can't remember if you mentioned this in the master class, which by the way, if anybody's still listening to this episode, go watch that. Just stop this show and just listen to Justine interview because it's fucking brilliant. <laughs> but, um, but a lot of it, it's like, it looks like a tracking shot, but basically the set is being moved towards the camera. Yeah, no, we talk about that, yeah, which I thought was like insane. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, because you it it feels strange when you're watching the movie, but you don't really register it because yeah, it was like, oh, of course, it's just like a tracking shot. And then when he mentioned it, and then seeing the movie again, you see it on such another light because the effect that it has is so different than a tracking shot. It's oh, like yeah. it's, it's almost like again, kind of talking about there is no real reality in the movie. I love that. Like I think that's a hundred percent point on Bill. Uh, it kind of contributes to that eeriness. Again, within a movie that I think is quite light and funny, despite a lot of darker elements, there's this kind of undercurrent of dread out of these small little moments or decisions that are made in the filmmaking that I think just like elevate to a whole new level and I I, I I can't remember that clearly I don't remember if it was just because of practicality because they had so few days of shooting or whatever and it was a more practical way of kind of rather than doing multiple camera setups I don't I don't remember if that's true or not but it kind of sounds familiar because I think what he was saying too like that movie was very 
lucky that it got shot during the strike. So a Mm. lot of the people who end up working on the movie were people who otherwise had normal jobs and were working for unions and were like, well, I'll work on it a day or two. And then when they show up on set, they're like, oh, I want to like be a part of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's got the truth. Yeah. When, yeah, because now I remember when he talked about the camera movement and you're right, when you go back and watch it, because of course I did, I had to be like, what? Because even I didn't realize, you know, you don't think about it. And it's that even, you know, when somebody's able to kind of subtly do camera movement in a way that's kind of not what you're used to, even subconsciously, it does just add. I remember like seeing an interview where they talked about how like Kinski, like Klaus Kinski was a fan of like being behind the camera and doing like the sort of swivel turn around it. You see him do that a lot in Aguirre, The Wrath of God, and it just kind of does sort of like upset your balance as a viewer. Like in a way, it kind of adds like an unsettling factor in a way, just because your eyes don't expect it. Your eyes aren't trained to see that and expect that movement, but it just, it adds so much to it. And then just, of course, Steven takes that to like the nth degree with having like the set be Kinski, <laughs> you know, it's just the way characters kind of float like in and out too. It's great. There's always movement. There's never really anything truly still in this movie. Did either of you ever watch the show Silk Stockings, the show that he did the production design on for like some of the episodes of it? It's been years. I have it on my Amazon wish list to get for research for um, the book, but I, uh, I just, but I used to, I actually used to get kind of mad at Silk Stockings because I didn't see the Sadian episodes as a kid because now I've seen like clips Mm -hmm. and you can distinctly tell which ones are Steve well, what's <laughs> because fun- of the set design. Well, what's funny yeah. is I was watching the pilot for Silk Stockings, which is on YouTube, and uh, there's a line where the police captain remarks on the office, which is very s- sadie like d- design, and the dialogue mm-hmm. is like, how am I supposed to work in a place like this? I'm supposed to be a cop. It's supposed to be a precinct, but this is like something out of a science fiction movie. This is a nightmare. Like, they're commenting on the production <laughs> design in the episode. It's very... Uh, <laughs> It's very kind of jarring, but the but the uh, the main detective defends it as kind of hip. But it's just they're calling out the production design in a way that's like, what kind of show is this? <laughs> I love that. Oh my god, that's that. It's the irony because I remember when Silk Stockings was on, and I was like, I think I was in junior high, and I get mad because like they um, USA would end up preempting uh, Real Wild Cinema, uh-huh. which was this amazing show that like had something weird video behind it, so you'd have clips from like Doris Wishman movies, Herschel Gordon Lewis movies, and. They'd interviewed like Russ Meyer and Sandra Bernhard hosted it. And um, I, I remember at the time being a kid and I'd be like, why are they preempting my real wild cinema for silk stockings? And now I'm like, shit, I got to go buy a silk stockings for research. <laughs> In terms of his career post Dr. Caligari, because when I was younger, I thought that that's where he stopped because the way IMDb in the early days kind of uh, d- gave you his career, it really didn't go into Party Doll, Go Go and Night Dreams mm-hmm. 2 and 3. Do you know why he never made another R-rated film like that he goes back into is it is it the freedom or the opportunities in in hardcore or do you know the story of like what comes next um i know him and jerry were had written a script uh and i want to say god i hope i'm getting this right that it was called rpm mm. and basically we're shopping it around and it had a lot of great feedback to it but it didn't get made um and my assumption with like Party Doll, now granted, Party Doll Go Go 1 and 2, I do recommend if you're a Stadium fan because they're a lot of fun. There is dialogue and weirdness and great audio. All the stuff that we've talked about kind of in the other films are there. I mean, they're much lighter. Yeah. fair and they're definitely a little more um like sex heavy than night dreams or cafe flesh but they're a lot of fun and gina fine is i think one of my favorite sadian actresses she's fantastic in this she's great in everything though but i imagine it's just kind of like you know i mean you got to make money i mean <laughs> you gotta be able you know i always kind of assume with certain you know one of the benefits of working in certain things is like you can do something you love but also hopefully use that money to fund not only living but to fund the next the, the thing that you really super want to do yeah um and i definitely think that was the case because he made two films called untamed cowgirls uh one and two but i know steven has pretty much told me those aren't really i wouldn't consider them canon okay they are interesting footnotes um but uh but part of all go go is definitely i mean i don't know how many adult films are going to have references or watch that especially from the 90s that reference rocket 88 <laughs> Or the girls keep saying like, "Rider stranger, like a rocket eighty-eight, which is like, oh my god, 
he just referenced a 1950s like you know song that's considered the first rock and roll song ever you know and Ike Turner's on that song and yeah it's um so it's got some really great dialogue I mean there's this whole thing about the wiggle um it's got 60s beach party energy actually it does but it also Mm -hmm. since you mentioned industrial music a little while ago it reminded me of industrial dance music from the wax tracks label from that same period because it feels like there's repetitious mantra-like use of the dialogue like someone will say something like "Uh uh-huh but then they'll like repeat it like a sample like with the Uh, same totally with the same like shot like just looped like it's very peculiar because you watch it thinking because it's shot on standard definition video like it's brighter and less kind of uh contrasty compared to cafe flesh or dr caligari Mm -hmm. or night dreams so it looks more like a quote unquote porno video, you know, at first, but then it's so goddamn weird that like, if you're watching it just for (laughs) that, you must, you might feel like, like an alien made it, but not like, it's not surreal the way something like Cafe Flesh is. It's like, it's, Right. It's mostly sex scenes. It's mostly like characters talking, but like then there's like these animal sounds on the soundtrack and like weird references to like Bosco, like mm, Bosco. Like it yes. has like that same kind of referencing and, and teasing advertisements. And it has, and like there's lines like, you know, they're overcome with retro wordplay, <laughs> like, like, like things that feel like Jerry Stahl kind of lines, but it's like Night Dreams in that there's a lot more protracted sex scenes the way you would expect mm-hmm. in, a, in a, an adult film, like versus, um, Cafe Flesh and definitely Dr. Caligari, which is uh, R-rated. Um, like it feels closer to what you think you're getting with adult film, but then um, there's all these things that like kind of keep like dragging it out and making it strange. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, and the editing, the editing's so great. And you're right. I didn't even think about the wax tracks compared to some, but that's great. Yeah, because there's a well, it cracks it because you know with standard like heteronormative porn you always have the girl girl scene that's as old as time like even going with like sexploitation films in the 60s but and party all go go they call it the girl they, they they'll announce it and be like girl homo and then one girl will come in she's like big time girl homo and she's like uh-huh 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> and it is kind of interesting because i feel like this is the first film where you really see like people that were pretty big in the industry because with like both night dreams dorothy lillian was more of like dorothy maybe was like more of a cult kind of stuff star you know and she was the biggest star in that cafe flesh um you know there were people that were active like the men were more involved in adult than the women in that one but and here you have like gina fine tom byron you know who was in the industry i think for 20 or 30 years randy west uh tiana madison um raven and so it's interesting to see kind of like these bigger tier stars of that era um doing this amazing dialogue i love i love that you mentioned bosco because bosco is such a character i love and like Cafe Flesh, the little wise talking Chicago bartender, you know. But um, yeah, and just the whole thing of just, you know, did she ever listen? No, she never listens. And you're right, they repeat dialogue like that um, yeah, like, all oh, throughout. Like, oh, she's smoken, like is repeated. Like, but it feels, yeah, it mm-hmm. feels like the movie equivalent to like, like old My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult records or something. Like, it feels like just lots of <laughs> yes. dialogue samples, but like you're watching the movie that they're sourcing from. Yeah, it. yeah. yeah. It's, it's 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 odd because it's not it's not something you really see in the like you get the witty one liners and something like Cafe Flesh or Dr. Caligari, but it's almost like they're even making fun of that idea in this by like mm-hmm. by repeating them to the point where it's like it's no longer even a joke. It's like just sound collage. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um God, I just yeah, the editing and like the 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 audio or at one point you hear like somebody saying party doll like go go mm. but it's like slowed down or it's like party doll I can't do it but you, <laughs> you get the <laughs> you get you get the picture um I mean it's it's shot on video but it, it, that one kind of opened my mind because I was honestly and I probably still am a little bit just such a, a snob especially when I first saw it of being like oh that's when it all went to hell it was shot on video and of course you can make great art on video it just depends on how you do it it's kind of talking about the internet though what you're saying earlier Justine is it's not that there were people not making great content it's just there's so much more of it because video is a cheaper format and now with the internet i mean people can shoot something on their iphone and upload it so it's you know but somebody can make great art doing that it's just trying to filter you know and and find it yeah talk about curation really i mean like that's where i think a lot of it gets lost where there's Mm -hmm. not even a space like i i mean talking about like festivals or even online platforms i think that there should be a bigger movement there like 
building on what kind of already is happening, where there are people who are going to be doing some of that curatorial work to help people find it. Mm -hmm. Because like, obviously, there's amazing stuff being made. But like, how do you actually find it? That's, I think, the big question. Yeah, but I love, I don't know, it's just like, I think it's so exciting, though, that, that, that you're anybody that is cynical, it's like, no, like, you talking about writing your screenplays, you know, and then, like, you know, listening to people, like, when I listen to, like, the Holly Randall's podcast, where it's, like, realizing, no, there are people out there, like, still trying to, you know, I mean, they're having to work, I mean, in some ways, almost, like, tighter confines, because it's all financially based, you know, now, but that there are people still, like, being like, okay, what can we do? What can we do that's interesting? and different Mm -hmm. and that isn't just the expected and I think you know when you have that there's always like the nucleus of something really really vital especially when it comes to art movements so yeah well I mean to bring it back to Dr. Caligari, I mean, one of the things I find so inspiring about it is as beautiful as it is, it also has a handmade quality. Like it feels like something that was created on sets by people, like as a labor of love. Like it feels like um, it's probably hard to do, but it feels like attainable as a thing. If you wanted to make something in that style, I remember my uh, my friend James you know, after seeing those films, Dr. Caligari and Kevy Flesh, for years, he wanted to make a film like that himself. Like he never got to make one, but he, I mean, he, I think it inspired him more than any of the films that we watched, the hundreds of things we watched. Like those were films that like made him want to make a film because it felt like he could see all the parts to it. Like, but it made sense in how, how, how like he wrote a script, he never got to make it, but he wrote a script that was inspired by those films. I, I think that like, if you approach it with like, you can have an interesting location and that gives you the freedom to have an interesting looking film without a lot of money. If you just, I mean, mm-hmm. I think about a horror film like Messiah of Evil, which is a low budget horror <sighs> film, but it has such a uh, unique location because they had uh, Jack Fisk and Joan Mocene design all these murals and uh, interesting production design that even when nothing scary is happening, it's interesting to look at because they've created such an unusual world. And I, I think that something like Sadian's films, they, they always take place in interesting like looking locations. So it's, I think that that would be inspiring to people that are just trying to get visual ideas like you you could make a small space into something that would be compelling i mean that's always the big problem with so many independent films is that uh they aren't interesting visually because Mm -hmm. they don't have the money Mm -hmm. but these films show that you don't need a lot of money to have interesting films that are um eye candy as well as interesting thematically and interesting in terms of the writing and the dialogue absolutely well and the fact that like all of these films you know you feel like the world within each one of these films is huge like and you and you you get a sense of a total kind of even when it's like ethereal world you know the dream you think about dreams have no walls and that's kind of how like Steven's films feel they feel you know wallless there are no there are no real borders you know even in something like cafe flesh where it's literally set in a place that is a cafe you know? <laughs> but yeah. it's still like the expanse of it all yeah i mean if you i just think if you if you have a vision and access to people that are really good at building sets <laughs> which helps because that's the thing steven's so great at attracting really talented people yeah i mean that's the thing you don't need a huge budget to make something great how many big budget movies out there are are utterly boring you know yeah (laughs) a lot i mean you know because people can just yeah i mean you have something that's cgi and it's beautifully technically done but does it compel you does it stay with you do you keep thinking of that one image over and over like you would with Dr. Calgary or Cafe Flesh or, or other films like Messiah Evil's a beautiful uh, reference because I mean I think about some of those murals sometimes too or just certain shots in that movie like it's it's um you know I think sometimes there's too much emphasis put on money well in general in life but <laughs> yeah. but especially with cinema like it's um you know sometimes the real innovators are the ones that are having to work under a little bit of a tighter budget so well, I was thinking about I mean because the first feature that we have for him is Night Dreams and his production design is such a big part of it. And I thought about how certain interesting production designers could you make that leap into directing. I think about William Cameron Menzies going from some like things to come to directing Invaders from Mars, or I think about even someone like Derek Jarman doing set design on The Devils before making his own feature films, or Edgar G. Almer doing design on something like The Last Laugh or Metropolis before going on to do things like Detour or Black Cat. Like it's it's not like a, there's not a, like a long list of production designers becoming directors, but I think about people like that, or even Catherine Hardwick going from tape heads 
to 13 and Twilight. I mean, you know, you have, um, you know, you, a few cases of that, but like someone like Sadie, you know, the design is such an enormous component of it, but um, it's one thing to just have great looking design, but like the, he brings all the other things on top of it to make them like pop as, as films. But I mean, mm-hmm. that, that was just something I was thinking about, like, like with Night Dreams, because I was thinking about like him as a director, not even having to be the quote unquote title director on a film like Night Dreams to like have his vision so imposed in all these other areas that we don't always talk about so much as the auteur directors because we don't always talk about the sound designer or the production designer but like he wears those hats as well as writer director on these but uh, any other thoughts you want to um, say about uh, Stephen Sadian I I think we I feel like we've covered a lot of great ground I don't know Justine was there I hope I I didn't become too much of a chatty Kathy here or (laughs) no 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 Um, I've learned so much like I think that's what's so cool I mean, the only thing that I'd like to add is, like, I really hope that a new audience gets to discover Stephen's films and that Stephen gets to make more films because it's clear he has so much left to say. Like, and I, I'm I'm really, really excited to see what, what, ha- what he has in store. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. And I think, I do think there's, you know, maybe... I don't know. I think there's always like a generation that's open to great stuff that they haven't seen before. Like I think I always hate it when sometimes people talk down about younger generations and because it's it's bullshit. But it's also just like, no, I mean, you know, every if you're a human being and you have a brain, like nobody likes being talked down to. I think there's a lot of filmmakers and and film that sometimes talks down to the audience instead of engaging them and, and being like come be a part of this world no matter how dark it is or vibrant it is or you know mysterious or sexy or whatever and when a filmmaker gives you that gift there's something special there's absolutely something special and Stephen Sadian is that to a T no I I, I, and I hope that uh, yeah, I know that he does have the new script and I know that uh, they're trying to get it made I, I would be so happy if that that does come to fruition I know he's you know had other films like you mentioned RPM that like uh, you know or is, it R, R, is RPM the title or REM rapid eye movement oh god i think it is rem see i told that's why i was like prefacing <laughs> well we, like, i'll just say that like you know yeah he's had um, the films that like you know he's written that, that, that didn't get made i hope that this one does mm-hmm. get made i think i think hopefully the world is going to be caught up with what he does and that it'll reach a wider audience like the way i think about like how someone like alejandro hodorowski you know mm. had all those years building up a new audience that understood El Topo and Holy Mountains so that when he comes back with something like Dance of Reality, like a whole new generation excited about it. Hopefully they'll be the same for oh, Sadian. Absolutely. And Dance of Reality was beautiful. So I think I think it'll I think that's a wonderful comparison. Yeah. Well uh I I'm going to be entirely indebted to both of you for talking to me today about this. I, I, I thought this was a lot of fun. Can, can you tell the listeners um, where people can check out more of your work? Um, Heather, where, where can people uh, keep up with your latest work? Uh, well, they can um, go to my website, mondoheather.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Mondo Heather. And I also have a Patreon uh, that is, I know this is going to shock everybody, at Mondo Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to remember. I'll put links to all this up too. How about you, Justine? Uh, you could find my writing usually through my Twitter at Red Room Rantings. And I do also have an Instagram under the same handle. Uh, that's I, But I recommend Twitter to find my work. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That was my conversation with Heather and Justine about the films of Stephen Sadian. Uh, but I decided to throw in an added bonus to make this episode three hours rather than two. Uh, Daniel Bird was the guest on my first episode of Supporting Characters in 2016. And I could probably make this episode four hours long if I read you Daniel's entire resume. Uh, but he's a writer, filmmaker, home video producer, programmer, film preservationist, uh, one of the world's leading scholars on Eastern European cult cinema, 
I first became aware of him through his work with Andrzej Zhuavsky. He was a friend and script consultant for Zhuavsky. He organized a weekend with Andrzej Zhuavsky, uh, the first English language you know, overview of Zhuavsky's films at the Cine Lumiere in 1998, in addition to moderating a number of Zhuavsky audio commentaries, including Possession and L'Important C'est de Mer. Uh, he co-produced the restoration of On the Silver Globe and adapted uh, Cosmos into English. Uh, he directed The Other Side of the Wall, The Making of Possession in 2009. Yeah, he's written for publications ranging from Eyeball to the Calvert Journal to Animus, and he's the author of Boro, Valerian Borovchik, and Roman Polanski, The Pocket Essential Guide. He's written uh, DVD and Blu-ray booklet essays for titles ranging from Dawn of the Dead to Walkabout to The Witch. He's been a programmer for places like National Media Museum, the BFI South Bank, Film Society of Lincoln Center, Metrograph, and lectured for organizations like the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies and curated an exhibition on the posters of Barbara Baranowska at the Horse Hospital in London. Uh, he's recorded audio commentary including Shamanka for Mondovision, Cosmos and Love Rights for Kino Lorber, The Ascent for the Criterion Collection, Crystalia for My Car for Arrow, I uh, know Second Run have ported over a few of his old commentaries with Peter Hames, including uh, for uh, Valerie and Her Week of Wonders and Daisies, and he's produced restorations on a number of early Valerian Borovchik films, for a number of Sergei Perijanov films, including The Colored Pomegranates, uh, he did one for Alexei Gurman's uh, Crystalia for My Car, and he's the co-founder of Acid Pictures, which co-produced restorations Restorations of uh, Jane Campion's Peel, uh, Peter Weir's Picnic at Hanging Rock, and Stephen Sadian's Dr. Caligari, which is coming to Blu-ray and 4K from Mondo Macabro later this year. And since I knew in addition to restoring Dr. Caligari last year, he's been at work on Café Flesh, I wanted to talk to Daniel about the process of rescuing these films and what Stephen Sadian's work means to him. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So here's a conversation I had with Daniel Bird. ask you this. Um, I guess my first question for you would be, uh, what was your first introduction to Stephen Sadian's work? What did you see first? Okay, so I first read about these films. Uh, I think it, it was an article in Flesh and Blood, edited by Harvey Fenton. Mm -hmm. And there was another article, which I remember in Shock Express, the Stefan Yewartz in um, collection. It was uh, later it appeared as books, and I think it was the second volume of that. So I remember reading about those films in, it must have been the mid to late 90s. And obviously, I'm sure you know this experience all too well. Mm. You read things, you read descriptions, you read scenarios, uh, you see a few stills, and you start to construct and to build uh, films in your head. So I very much wanted to see these films, but it was an awful long time before I got to see them. And I finally got to see Dr. Caligari first. That was the first one. Okay. And, well, it didn't disappoint. <laughs> why have these films, Dr. Caligari and Cafe Flesh, that you've been working with, why have they been so hard to see in the last 20 or so years? Really, since the VHS releases, I think... Um they haven't been widely available here. I mean, to the degree they were widely available at all. But I mean, uh, why, why have they fallen out of circulation in the DVD era? Uh, you know, look, uh, we've talked many times and I'm asked this question about many films and filmmakers on the same subject. And I, I'm really, um, I'd love to say that there was a, a reason, some sort of global conspiracy or, a, a, you know, or something something exciting. But, but no, it, it really does boil down to rights and materials disputes. And um, I mean, that unfortunately is the case with pretty much every film which goes out of distribution. Mm. Um, and, and it very much was the case with, with these films. Um, in the case of Dr. Caligari, the film was owned by, uh, at the time, a company called Excalibur Films, and that was related to how the film was um, financed. And um, on top of that, there were major materials issues uh, I, I wasn't certainly aware of any prints in any, any collections I mean really the, the, the question of actually getting these films back into distribution goes back I would say 
almost 10 years, maybe more, because there, there is a great festival in Paris, uh, Le Tronche Festival, every September in Forum des Images. And they were going to do, or they wanted to do, a programme, a retrospective, And uh, they were contact. I mean, I, I was contacted and, uh, you know, um, suggested through Steve. And, and um, it was really clear and apparent at the time that there were major, major issues in terms of no films to screen. So that really started a process of, of contacting Excalibur. And, uh, uh, and then basically it turned out that they did actually, in addition to a, a, a kind of one-inch video, which was used for the screening at Le Tranche Festival, and I believe was screened a few times at the Draft House. Um, after asking around, and it's all down to the, the heroic efforts of the um, an employee called Patty, uh, we were asking, are there any other elements? And, and yeah, and it turned out that they had the complete camera negative in the basement, which mm. was um, a relief for me, because usually in these instances, the first port of call is the laboratory which processed the film. And when I spoke to the laboratory in Los Angeles, they said the negative had been taken out. And since we had no idea where it was, um, you know, my, my heart started to sink. And so it was a question of basically looking who checked it out, and it turned out to be one of the uh, executive producers. And then he gave us, directed us back to the company, and then finally... Um, they actually, yeah, unearthed the negative, which was which was interesting because because they were a video company, they weren't really focused on dealing with negatives. They were dealing with video and video replication. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think they only had two two film elements in their entire operation. So um, so yeah, it was a question of basically Stephen buying back the film. And with it, the uh, original camera negative, and that really was the starting point for the second life of uh, Dr. Caligari. And in, in a similar situation, that was the the case of uh, of Cafe Flash buying back the rights. The, the The material situation in Cafe Flash has been much more complicated, uh, and that's simply down to the fact is is that to the best of our knowledge, uh, we don't know where the original camera negative is, and we've traced three elements, a um, duplicate negative and uh, two prints of different condition. And um, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. The only thing I would say which is really in our favor because Cafe Flash was a low budget film and they made the prints directly from the negative. So in fact, the prints which do exist are you know, a, a great amount of detail and information. So um, they're kind of like interpositives, which have unfortunately been run through projectors many times. So um, we were extremely lucky in Caligari in terms of basically it was in very good condition. It was in the early stages of, uh, of vinegar syndrome of deteriorating in the cans. I mean, uh, the, you know, it was fine to, to, to run through the scanner and everything else. But um, yeah, and I, it's, I think those, those elements are going straight to cold storage at, at some point this year. Uh, but in the case of Cafe Flash, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's uh, it's an ambitious project because of the condition of the materials and the range of the materials and uh, and all sorts of things like that. So, um, I mean, the, the, there there is an irony for me in terms of if you have a film and it's screened and people, oh, it looks amazing, it looks amazing. It usually looks amazing because the film element was in good condition. The negative was in good condition, you know, and it hadn't been touched too much. And those kind of projects, they don't involve as much work as a project like Cafe Flesh, whereby, um, yeah, the, the, the film elements are all banged up and, and messed and scratched and things like that and faded. So, um, yeah, you have to do an awful lot more work. And, hmm. and that's currently what we've been faced with and engaged with uh but um it's exciting i mean i think it's certainly for me it's uh you know one, one of those last great holy grails of cult film we wanted to do this restoration to the highest possible archival standards and given that the condition of the elements it is going to require a lot of manual work now in the case of restoration i think that the basic step is to ensure that you've located the best available elements 
and then you've cleaned them physically and then scanned them on the best available scanner. Uh, and um, so you've got as much information as possible to deal with. And then after that, you've really got two strategies as to how to, to, to bring that film back to life. And uh, one is using automatic processes, which... Um, are, well, cheap because you're not paying people, but the danger is is that basically uh, you get lots of artefacts and things like that. And mm. the other route is to use physical restoration artists, but of course that is both time-consuming and expensive. So it's really a business of striking a balance between those two things. And in this case, given the damage to the materials, uh, this is why it is a major project because, um, uh, yeah, it requires an awful lot of work care and attention. Uh, I've personally never been involved in a project in which the individual elements for the restoration have come from such a range of different sources and places. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not, it's not just a remastering job. It's a, it's a full scale operation so that we can actually ensure that it is, uh, not just available, but to archival standards, because quite frankly, you know, I, I, I think Cafe Flesh should be in the national registry. I really do, because basically, um, you know, the, the, the whole point of the National Register is to, to identify films which are of cultural significance, historic significance, and aesthetic significance. And, and whether you like it or not, Café Flesh ticks all of those boxes. It, um, it is a time capsule of a particular moment in American cultural life. Uh, it's not just the kind of the end of the Cold War, uh, if we can say that in this day, of um, sort of like this uh, nuclear anxiety and things like that. Uh, it's also the very beginning of what would become the kind of the HIV AIDS epidemic of the 80s. Uh, but it also captures the cultural um, styles at that time. And, you know, so I think that from that point of view, it's really important. Um on top of that, uh, I mean, I think the influence of the film in terms of even though Sidon only has directed a handful of films to date, coupled with uh, a writer like Jerry Stahl and a musician like Mitchell Froome, the influence of that team on literature, on music, uh, not just cinema, but also music videos, graphic design and theatre, and in turn, the things which they've influenced both during the 80s and 90s is um, really immeasurable. Uh, so I really think that um, even though people aren't really, let's say, directly influenced by a film like Café Flesh, they've probably influenced by something Café Flesh has influenced. Mm. So I think when you actually stitch all those things together, the, the historic backdrop, uh, the way it taps into so many impulses of the time and on top of that the um yeah the the aesthetic interest i think it's a it's it's it's, it's a major film it's a major part of of film history and last but not least i think it's one of the very very few examples and the only one which really i would jump to compare it to is uh, nagisa oshima's eino Corrido or empire of the senses it's one of the very, very few films, I think, in which um, you have hardcore sex and it kind of is impossible to imagine the film without those scenes because so much of the film is about watching sex and sexual performance, the performative aspect of sex and things like that. I'm not quite sure. I mean, apparently there was a, a, a softcore version ed edit which went around the UK, which I've not seen, but I can't imagine the film without the hardcore sequences in order for it to work in the way that you know, the, 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 the dynamic the story establishes and things like that. So I think it is unique in that respect. And um, uh, it really does show how dull and unimaginative 99% of porn films are. And as part of this very tiny group of the 1%, it really does also show the possibilities uh, of both uh, exploring and subverting the genre. So I think for all of those reasons, it's worth the effort and it has justified all of this mad running around from the Kinsey Institute, from various archives to Buenos Aires and things like that. I'm excited about it. I mean, I've only ever grown up with the, the VHS uh, VHS version that uh, is probably the source of all the uh, 
the, the, the ripped files that circulate online. Well, the, the DVD that was available was sourced from the same video master, so there's no real difference there. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it, I think it is a film. I, it's like with many things which um, I've certainly been involved in. It, 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 uh, it's so much of it is about context, and um, it's how you present these films uh, and how you frame the films and how they're perceived. And I, I really think that that is part of the story of Café Flash, of how it failed as an adult film. And it really only found its audience at the new art, initially replacing Pink Flamingos uh, as a midnight movie. So in that particular edit... Oh, by the way, there is a difference between those two versions. Um, and I know this... I, I've, not only do I know this, I've seen it uh, up close and personal. And that is... Um, that um, Sidian cut the, 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 the money shots out of the X version. Hmm. So it still has penetrative sex and everything else, but it doesn't have those, those kind of those cum shots. Yeah. So, yeah. Th- so there are some prints. Okay, yeah. one of the prints is the complete X version, let's say. And then another print, which is the print in the Kinsey Institute, uh, it has all of those shots uh, cut out and spliced so we were actually going look physically going through those reels and uh, uh and i was there with with said and doing this a couple of years ago and, and he said no no i purposely remember there was something like eight or nine prints and i cut out these scenes and that was that was like part of its uh, um evolution from an x film into a cult film and um that also presents a uh a question about what you present now uh, in the cinemas and on um, home movies and uh, but fortunately with the the joy of home media and branching and things like that you can probably have the choice at home you know do you want cafe flash with extra man mayo or not you know it's uh, <laughs> It's uh, you know, so 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 those are uh, so obviously we're restoring, you know, the, the complete super, uh, you know, that 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 is the starting point because you know why would you limit yourself? But at the same time, uh, I think we're still wrestling with questions about which which version to present, mm. um, you know, as and when it comes to the moment of screening it theatrically. But of course, th- those problems aren't there on uh, on home media. Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, was going to say just as an aside, like I'm just so excited, like to to own these films in in, in decent versions finally <laughs> well, as, a, as just as a, as a long time fan of the films um, so, so so am i i mean i, I think caligari in caligari is it's was still doing a little bit of work on the sound ahead of the um the blu-ray release yeah. um via mondo macabro and that's simply because we had access to all the original sound stems mm. and um there were some elements of the film which basically um Mainly to do with the mixing of the music in the title sequence, which um, Sadian thought could be improved. So, um, and yeah, the negative was immaculate, and the um, the film uh, visually it looks stunning, and 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 the fact that, for example, um, uh, all of those video masters were all framed full frame, uh, when in fact it was composed for like Cafe Flash one eight five, so you know flat cinemascope. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was, to be honest, I was. It, it, it's one of those strange experiences where you're so used to seeing a film in a particular ratio and a particular composition. I was skeptical, and you know, is, is this really right? And <laughs> just check this. And, he said, and, and said it was adamant that yeah, that, that it was all composed for one eight five. So by the time we put the mask on, yeah, it's quite clearly one eighty five, and it looks stunning. Uh, now, and of course, the the cinema ones that they're four K DCPs, but of course. Uh, the the copy which has been prepared for for Blu-ray is in um, high dynamic range. Now, I mean, admittedly, there's not much in the way of dynamic range in a title like Dr. Caligari because of the way it's designed. Um, but uh, the fact that you're able to um, present this film in a, in a resolution which is really hasn't been seen ever. Both films were very, very close to being lost. Yeah. And... I mean, this is one of the big ironies in the way that, you know, in, in, in the Soviet republics and Eastern European countries I'm used to deal with, even if a film was banned or shut down, the elements would go to an archive, a state archive. Um, the titles which are really vulnerable are the ones produced in the commercial marketplace, because if you don't pay 
uh, your lab fees, they get junked. Mm. And that's what often happens, especially when ownership gets disputed or lost. Uh, the fellow elements stay in a lab and then they get junked because no one's paying for them. And or somebody keeps a film element and keeps the film under a radiator or, you know, something like that. And then it's unscreenable. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's kind of shocking to think titles of the kind of calibre and, and stature of, of Night Dreams, Dr. Caligari and Cafe Flesh are in this 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 predicament. But with regards to Dr. Caligari and Cafe Flesh, I know that by the end of this year, they will be... Um, very, very safe uh, for for generations to come, and uh, uh, and that's simply by going to all this effort of locating elements, buying them back, restoring them, and making copies, uh, archival elements, and also hopefully thirty five millimeter elements as well. And uh, you know, and I think that that really is the um, you know I've talked about this before, but I think th- there is this idea that you know films fall in and out of fashion because of this that or the other you know the 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 the, the you know this film is thrust into the limelight because of I don't know, the patriarchy and and this film is, is obscured for that reason and and, and 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 you can solve all these problems by tweeting an angry tweet or something like that and um no it it really is banal if you're involved in anything to do with programming uh, restoration, distribution, as many of the guests on supporting characters who work in these fields have said and will say, it's really banal. It's about ownership. It's about film elements. And it's about money. And uh, that's why it's so important, I think, to, um, to not only recognise that, but to make sure that there is a budget there to, to give a film like Café Flesh the uh, justice, care, and attention it deserves. We've been doing this, let's say, 10 years, pretty much under the radar. Uh, and, and, and Caligari um, was um, kind of... Uh, 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 this was uh, the dedication of Wojtek Janio and Gosha Gzeb, in particular, the um, uh, restoration director and colorist who I regularly work with in Los Angeles, um, but in the case of Cafe Flash, it's yeah, it's it's it's, it's proving to be a big task. But um, it's been a thrill to to speak to both Sayedin and to um, Jerry Stahl and uh, and and people like Stoyer talking about their appreciation of the film and uh, Madeline Raynell, the the star of Doctor Caligari. So I think that um, it'll be wonderful for those films to appear on physical media with all that contextual material, with the input of the people who were involved in the making of the film, uh, but also commentaries from people from a variety of perspectives, uh, performers and writers like Stoyer, but also Jacob Smith, who wrote an excellent article, a pioneering article, I would say, in The Velvet Light Trap, appreciating not just Sadin's films, but particularly his sound design. And I had the pleasure of interviewing him at Northwestern University, and he gave an incredibly articulate and, and entertaining dissection of why, for him, those films are so interesting. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a really exciting project to work on, and um, it's uh, it's it's wonderful to be on the home straight. And uh, but it really is vital that um, yeah we we can actually get Cafe Flesh looking absolutely amazing because as I said, I, I do think the film should be in the National Registry. And, and that's not that's not you know, I do think it's on par with something like a razor head uh, and pink flamingos and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And that that's that for me is the 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 class it should be in. And it's the class I want to be in, you know, this yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Razor Head, Pink Flamingos and Cafe Flash. It just seems to be the the ultimate class. And uh, and that's I'd like to think we're doing everything we can to make it be there and uh, to stay there. I remember you talking about Cafe Flesh back when you were in New York uh, to show uh, the three uh, restorations of the uh, of the Zhuwaski Polish films uh, back when Cosmos was a new release. So I know that this has been something you've been working on for years. So well, I, mean, I think with, with it's like with all of these projects, it's it's. Um, 
you're not working at them constantly. It's just that you you have them kind of on the back burner, and then when when an element turns up, or you know when a, a, the you know you get you progress with a, a sort of a, a chain of ownership, or you're able to finance or find the finance to actually buy them, you know things like that. And then suddenly you can start work on them and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean it's, it's certainly. Uh, um, it, it's been a good ten years uh, since the first um, attempts to look for elements and owners. So uh, yeah, it's it's it's. I have to pinch myself sometimes that you know this is actually happening. I think it was more strange with Dr. Caligari because it was such an adventure getting to the point of restoring the film, and then um, it was kind of building up. We had this great experience with Fantasia Festival in the middle of the pandemic and they early on made the bold decision to make the festival online and uh, it was great to find someone so uh, sympathetic and understanding as Justine Smith because she not only got the films but she had all of these ideas about how to present them and contextualize them not necessarily with in-person events so it was wonderful to work with her on the um the the masterclass and also the virtual gallery uh, and then after that uh, fantastic fest uh, we're going to do a an in person physical screening in Los Angeles and this was the beginning of October and I had hoped to go across uh, for no other reason than to to think that <laughs> this is real and this is happening uh, but unfortunately that wasn't possible because of the travel restrictions. I mean, a lot's changed in this last 10 years. So, for example, when when Saidian came to, to Paris and we had this, uh, you know, it was the first time we met in person and, and, and it, was, it was a great three, four days to really to talk about very certain things. And I think one of the things we talked about was uh, Lars von Trier. And, um, yeah, uh, certainly my mixed feelings about the idea of, say, for example, both in Antichrist and um, Nymphomaniac, Nymphomaniac yeah. uh, about the, the use of, 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 of porn doubles and things like that. Um, so the idea that it, it just just seems wrong that you you, you, you you basically kind of demarcated two classes of performers. <laughs> 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 one, one, one who's selling identity and then the other one who you're, you're, you're selling sexual organs uh, essentially now I'm, I'm sure that no one has a problem with that and everything else but it it, it, it seems to be the slightly hypocritical arena whereby on the one hand you're having festivals particularly cam festival whereby it's almost like an annual ritual which is the film it's going to shock and that's usually presented by gaspar noe you know, a yeah. filmmaker who I like and I'm always looking forward to his new work and everything else. But there is something slightly paradoxical. Here you have a filmmaker who is either in the main selection or in, you know, the the, the, the midnight screening or something. So you're part of the filmmaking establishment presenting uh, and people are expecting shocking imagery. So it, it, it's this strange sort of paradox whereby how do you shock people these days? On top of that, this business, how, yeah, we, we, you know, you're saturated in por- pornography and, and these images. So the question is, um, which place do they have in society, in our inboxes, you know, <laughs> on, on, on our streaming queues and things like this? And, um, uh, you know, and, and I think that the, the, the main issue uh, and the, the really fascinating thing about the interviews with both Jerry Stahl and, and Sadie and things like this is, is how they talk about going out of the way to make the sex um, anti-erotic, not stimulating. Um, there's this great story which Sadian said when he was one of the performers in Cafe Flash was getting into it too much and, and he stopped the scene and went over to her and said, do you have a favourite pet? And she said, yes. And then he said, it just died. Now go fuck. You know? <laughs> so you've got this... It's like method acting, you know, <laughs> sort of... But, <laughs> So the Stanislavski of, and everything else. And, and then there is the interesting question itself. Um, I, I was lucky enough to, to go to uh, Belgrade just about a month ago and um, uh, I was able to interview Stoya uh, about Café Flesh because, of course, she's not only a huge fan of the film, but she's written 
uh, very, very interesting things about that film, specifically something she's written a lot about, namely how uh, she's interested in the performative aspect of uh, pornography, and this is the subject of Café Flash, uh, in how, in a dramatic situation, it establishes that dynamic between the audience and the performer. And... Um, so it's, it, you know, I think there's an awful lot to discuss about that film and it's interesting uh, and it's great fun. I mean, the dialogue, I think, is just off the scale. The music is just uh, spectacular and the design, I mean, it, it looks incredible for a film which is clearly shot um, on a very, very tight schedule and um, it is has a look, and, and this is something which I, I think someone was asking me about, what, what is the common thread between, I don't know, Alexei German, Zhuavsky, Borovchik, and um, Parajanov, and Syedian. And um, the only real answer is, is that they all have a look. Uh, they all have a specific uh, vision of things and, and cinema and, uh, and how things should appear. And I personally really, really love the idea of coming off this five-year project working with Parajana Films in Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, with these outtakes, these installations in Rotterdam and blah, 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 and then immediately going into Sadian because um, I think that on the one hand, these two filmmakers couldn't be more different in terms of how they're perceived because one is perceived as some sort of like, you know, uh, mainstay of the art house canon and the other is a cult filmmaker who's um, uh, somewhere between uh, adult film at the midnight circuit. But for me personally, I think that they have many things in common, uh, particularly this tableau approach to making tableaus, lighting tableaus, and, uh, and sort of breaking time and narrative to have this performative aspects in film. So maybe it was the fact that I was working on this outtakes project in Cafe Flesh at the same time, but the two things were sort of blurring into one another, the same with Caligari. And they're both freaks. Parajanov was a freak and, uh, and Sadian's a freak. And, and I think, I mean, freak, I mean, it, it was, I mean, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not using that word loosely. Um, I had to give a talk at a UNESCO conference on film preservation and restoration in, in Yerevan. And I chose to talk about Sadian's films. And it's specifically about why we should be saving these films, uh, including the video work. And I really found that, you know, the, the Frank Zappa, uh, yeah, definition of what a freak is really embodies and sums up what Sadin and the films are about. Much more than, for example, um, any sort of um, uh, history of, let's say, the end of the golden age of porn, because it, it's kind of, I think it's really on just short selling those films to actually, to talk about Night Dreams and Cafe Flesh as some sort of like the, the last gasp, the last moan of the golden age of porn before uh, video consumed it. Right, right. Uh, I think they're much more than that. Um, I mean, they, that that is an aspect of those films. It is one facet, but it is not the defining characteristic. And... Uh, and even the later video stuff, stuff like Party Dollar Go Go and Night Dreams 2 and 3 and, and the, the Cowgirls 2 films, they're not completely without interest. Uh, and I think that if you... Um, I think that I would say one of the very, very few cases where the bridges between sex scenes is more interesting than the sex scenes themselves. Yeah. I'd agree. And I, I actually never saw Party Doll Go Go one and two until this year. I I didn't even know that those things existed back when I first discovered I didn't even know that Night Dreams existed. When I first knew about Steven Sadian and Rinse Dream, you know, films, I only knew the two uh the two that you've worked on. Um I didn't know about the others. I don't think IMDB really kind of helped clarify his career back when I first, you know read about these films i think i found out about cafe flesh through cult movies three the danny perry book and then caligari i found in a uh, in a cult section at a local video store and i didn't even know about night dreams until the projection booth did an episode on it so whenever that was um because it wasn't like there was resources <laughs> in my town about uh you know figures like this so it's been an education I, and actually even just reading about like his theater work like jackie charge um which sounds 
like an appropriate bridge between Cafe Flesh and Dr. Caligari when I read the descriptions of it. I don't know if I, I assume that somewhere the uh, the play itself survives on paper. Oh, but- the, 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 cl- the play itself does survive on paper. And I, I've read it and I've read, I think I've read two versions of it, a, a very long draft and then a cut down draft. Mm. Uh, the play, there are f- some sort of advertisements which survive and some sort of flyers promoting it. It was at the Gene Donarski Theatre, so non-union, so it was limited space. But from what I understand and from what the people I've spoken to, it had a absolutely huge impact on that scene, let's say. Uh, so it is not just, it's theatres, designers, musicians. Devo was a huge fan. You know, Timothy Leary was going, you know, uh, and things like that. So it's, it, it is, I think, that um, as in the case of somebody like Borovchik and also Parajanov, I think that to talk about uh, Saidian uh, specifically in terms of cinema or, or genre uh, is to do a disservice because, in fact, not only does their influence extend other art forms, works on paper, uh, kind of installation work, uh, theatre, set design, things like this, designing album covers like with Wall of Voodoo, um, they're operating in those spheres. So they're sort of like, um, you know, figures who are at the, uh, you know, sort of not confined by any one practice or genre. I mean, I, I would say more than a direct... I mean, Sidon is a very, very a director in the true true sense of the word. Uh, and and as, in, in as much as I've known him, I mean, it's really been impressive um, uh, watching uh, how somebody... Um, uh, yeah, direct in life because the two things are blurred together. And um, but on top of that, I think that he is fundamentally a designer. He is concerned with the look of things, the organization of objects, the way light and everything else. Uh, if you if you look, it's. I mean, he always jokes about being a one trip pony. But I just said that. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you could draw a thread through all of the films, all of the album covers, all of the, all of the the, the spreads. All of the theatre, in terms of the use of smoke, the use of barbed wire, uh, the use of these certain props uh, and the this, this sort of opaque colours and things like that, uh, and, and there is a consistency and uh, there is a, a real vision there. And it's interesting how there are certain filmmakers now, um, like Zach Clark, Bertram Mandico, who are very explicit about the influence of Sadian. Uh, the difference is, and I think this is an important difference, is that a filmmaker like Bertrand Mandico is very much part of the, the, the French um, state public funded filmmaking system. So, in fact, all of those remarkable films like Wild Boys and the the more recent, what, what's the, the recent, after, is it what's called the, 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 it's got blue in the title. I don't know. Shit, but I can... Blue, is it called? They're all, um, let's say, um, art films in the um, the French legal sense, whereby they are the beneficiaries of um, of public money. So, of course, if you if you take these films, these images, and if you go through a certain system and they're sort of legitimized, let's say, by a um, more sophisticated critical community, people, you know, institutions like MUBI. Uh, the critics today are very different from the critics of 30, 40 years ago. Uh, they're usually the products of film studies degrees. They're very conscious about issues of gender, transgression, and they're able to back this up intellectually. The issue is, is that those films, they're, they're sort of, um, they don't have the shock value which Caligari and Cafe Flash had because culture's changed. Mm. Uh, I, I would say that, that if Sadian and Stahl are like heroin, uh, then filmmakers like Bertram Mandico, they're like methadone. It's like, you know, it's, the, <laughs> it's, it's a step to um, acceptance, let's say. Yeah. And, and I think what, what attracts me the most to this project is that I'm still not sure to what degree they will be accepted. And frankly, that excites me. It really does, because uh, I think what is the point with working with films and filmmakers if they've already got a safe place in the canon? I think the fun of the the most fun moment uh, of the Barovchik retrospective at Lincoln Center was um, uh, when um, Violet Luca introduced Behind Combat Walls on Easter Sunday and said, 
<laughs> this is the first instance of a non-exploitation film playing in the Walter Reed cinema. And I thought, yes, that's, that's, that's why we've gone to all this trouble. Because, you know, it's the first time a non-exploitation film has played at the Walter Reed. And um, now whether basically I'm complicit in dragging a legendary American institution in the gutter or expanding horizons i don't care but the point <laughs> is is that 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 makes it worthwhile in a similar fashion with um presenting the porridge of outtakes in a fine art context as if it was an installation because basically uh you are presenting that work in a way to an audience which is more attuned with i don't know marina abramovich than they are with soviet eastern european cinema yeah and that's great as well because basically People who wouldn't usually see this are seeing it. And uh, and I think that that really, is, really comes to a head with something like uh, Sidon and, uh, and Café Flesh and Dr. Caligari to basically to say that, yes, these are great cult films, but they're also so much more. And that's not to in any way belittle their cult film origins. On the contrary, it's basically to remind people that uh, often so-called cult films, midnight films, exploitation films, frankly have more interest than um, what are programmed as art films. Uh, not always, uh, but I think there are instances. Uh, and it goes back to something which uh, Sayedin said in, in, uh, in Paris. He said, I'd rather, I'd, rather make a, I'd rather make a porn film artistically than make an art film with porn elements, let's say. And, uh, and I think that that, that you know, the, the idea to, um, there is a level of pretension, let's say, is if you're, you, you know, it's like, it's like when people, you know, we, we, we talked about this uh, <laughs> when I was trying to find the word for elevated genre and I said genre plus. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, th that conversation, uh, because it's about basically uh, the, the, the same thing, the idea of saying, oh, no, 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 it's not a horror film. It's, it's a psychological drama. And you're saying no, 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 no. It's not a porn film. It's it, it's it's something else. And you're yeah. thinking, well, look, there's no there's no way which you can get around the fact that um, uh, the the video films, Party Dollar Go Go and Night Dreams Two and Three, and the 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 cowgirl songs, they, they are they are shot to video porn films. And the 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 sex scene is as boring. I mean, my my attitude about pornography is the same as ballet. Uh, in basically the vocabulary of ballet and pornography is very limited. Um, you know, whether it's a pirouette or a blowjob, you know, th th there's, there's only so many ways you can film that. <laughs> and right, you can have right. people doing very, very good pirouettes and very, very good blowjobs. And, you know, but that's, that's it. It's, it's, so I find for me personally, and I know that a lot of people take pornography very seriously as they do ballet. But for me, I do think that there's a, a fundamental problem with that particular genre uh, in, in the way that it, 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 it strikes me personally as quite limited. So it, it comes of no surprise that, that the bridges, the, 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 the steps between those scenes, which are usually just dead space traditionally, you know, it, it, it's always like a, an in-joke where people set up an absurd situation and make fun of the absurdity and blah, blah, blah. But to actually fill it with all of that insane dialogue and to actually have the performers addressing the camera is in Party Doll and, and to have fragments of an insane plot like in Night Dreams 2 and 3, that I think is great. And I'm particularly interested in Night Dreams uh, because it very clearly is um, it's as rooted in, in the tradition of vaudeville uh, as it is in... Um, uh, yeah, pornography. It's the idea that you actually have uh, little tableaus, little little um, attractions, as Eisenstein would say, punctuated with a, a sort of a refrain. Uh, in, in this case, the two scientists. But um, there, there is no narrative consistency between those episodes. On the contrary, they go in completely different. They literally go to heaven and hell uh, and the Wild West uh, and the horror <laughs> situation. And something involving a fetus and uh, and 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 um, and the and the Jack in a Box from from the Funhouse poster. Right. So I, I think that visually, it's interesting. I, I, I like the collision of all of those scenarios and and those situations. And um, I like this weird obsession he has of uh, which Brian De Palma when he when he wrote the guilty pleasures section in Film Comment, when he said that. 
whoever made Night Dreams is obsessed with boxes. And that's a very, I think, astute observation because when you look at that film, uh, there is box after box. There's a Jack in the Box. There's the, the guy in the cream of wheat box. And, uh, and it's sort of obscuring the performance. It's doing the one thing that you shouldn't really do in pornography in the way that, you know, you watch pornography to see something, not to, not to see the action obscured by a giant uh, cream of wheat box or, <laughs> or you know, or something like that, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that there's, um, there's so much going on in those films which um, uh, really needs to be... Uh, unpacked and discussed and the dust is far from settled and I think that's the reason for returning to those films uh, I say return but in, you know it, it's you return to them if you're familiar with them through video and I think an awful lot of people are seeing it for the first time when we've screened Dr Caligari so far most of the people in the audience have not seen Dr Caligari most people in their 20s mm. and, uh, and and it's something I've said before is that when you have a filmmaker presenting a film and people haven't seen it and they're kind of functioning and influencing, they are effectively new filmmakers. And this was particularly the case with one of the conversations I had with Andrzej Żuławski at the very end of his career and life, uh, saying that basically you have to remember in France you're a known quantity, whereas in New York you're a new filmmaker. And, um, you know, I mean, you may be, you know, an, a, an old fart grumbling about not being able to get money to make your next film. But thanks to the efforts of all these people, programmers, writers and distributors in the US, uh, he was at that particular moment in time a, a new filmmaker. And I think that's very much the position which uh, Sayedin is in at the moment. It's not so much looking back over this uh, remarkable body of work but really, when you talk to him and when you have a glimpse of what he's got cooked up, you're realising that he's only just getting started. And, um, and I think that whatever he does next, and I've read the script, um, will be as different from Dr. Caligari as Dr. Caligari is different from Café Flash, and Café Flash is as different from Night Dreams. And I think that's really exciting as a... Um, uh, a film goer or anyone interested in things which uh, look stylish and cool or weird, you know, it, it, it's sort of criminal that we have that we had this gap in David Lynch's filmography between Inland Empire and um, and uh, the last series of Twin Peaks. But um, it's wonderful to see filmmakers like David Cronenberg making genre films for the first time in in decades, and uh, and I, I really hope that. Uh, Sayadian can can join the ranks of Lynch and Cronenberg because that that's how I perceive. I, I think that I I've said this before. I think that that Sayadian is if he's going to be compared with anyone, it's Lynch because he's fundamentally a fine artist working in film and he has a track record working in art direction, print, making installation work, performance and things like that, heavily involved in music and literature. Uh, so I think that they are fellow travelers. They are both uh, riffing on Americana. In some ways, Sayadian was doing the, the Lynch thing before Lynch, when you think that all the Bob's Boy diner stuff in all those hustler spreads really predated Lynch doing that in Blue Velvet and um, uh, Twin Peaks. Um, but I think ultimately they're drawing from the same pool of references. Francis Bacon... I think is a major influence on Lynch as it is uh, Saidian. And um, uh, so I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I would like to think that in a few years that um, when, 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 when kids want to explode their minds with cinematic crack, they have a choice between the drug of Lynch or the drug of Saidian. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. No, I mean, th I discovered both filmmakers around the same age and they made, they made similar impacts on me and my, my late friend, James Izzo, who does the, um, does the music with me that s all the supporting characters uh, podcasts open with. Uh, that was like one of the, his favorite filmmakers was Sadie. And that was another reason why I wanted to do an episode on him. Um, but because... don't you think musically that there is a similarity between, um, let's say, what Mitchell Froome is doing, particularly in Dr. Caligari, with that kind of Angelo Badalamenti music, which is sort of... Um, Playing with kitsch 
And uh, I think that there is a similarity, and 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 that's certainly on the great music you have for supporting characters. Um, I think that that you know it, it's definitely in the same ballpark. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I even think of the um, the synthetic walking bass lines in Cafe Flesh as being not a million miles removed from something that Angela Badalamenti would do later. <laughs> also, for some reason, I, I always mentally at the very very when I first got into this, it was pretty much when I was really into the residents. Uh, so, I mean, I, for me, it was like residents, Devo, Cafe Flesh. I mean, it was all part of the same world. And um, uh, it's really, um, yeah, I think that the, the sound, I mean, the, the, the soundtrack of Night Dreams is, uh, you know, as compilations go, it's uh, it's just insane. I mean, the, I, I absolutely adore Morton Subotnik. Um, and you've got... You've got two pieces of music by Morton Subotnik in, in Night Dreams. Uh, and and who, who who else would have thought about using some electroacoustic tech music in a porn film, both for a scene and the bridges? It's it's incredible. And then you've got Wall of Voodoo, Ring of Fire, which is just, uh, you know, I could watch a whole film of just that, you know. Uh, and the colours uh, 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 and, the you know, er- everything about it, just like the... I, I'm always in two minds because on the one hand... It just struck me as insane poetic genius when you have this mishmash of like visuals, particularly like the, you know, the Wild West landscape, which isn't really kind of Monument Valley. It's like a Manhattan skyline, and and then you have these two two girls, and um, and you're thinking, well, why is it like that? Why is it like that? And then then you realize, in fact, that basically they were preparing or, you know, the, the side in and his art director and constructor, well, cause he was the art director, but really the, the construction and the prop people, they were making all of these objects and props for spreads and hustler. So they had this kind of storage of all of these elements. So it was quite, it was like a poverty as the, 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 or necessity as the mother of invention, but it was also quite surrealistic, the idea that just making, grabbing different props and elements and making kind of like a, a, a collage or an exquisite corpse. I mean, that's how the, in the, the cream of wheat scene, when, when uh, Sayadin makes his cameo as, as, a, as a piece of bread uh, <laughs> playing a Saxophone. Playing go of saxophone. Well, you know, the bread came from a, a sketch for Hustler called Night of the Living Bread. Uh, so, yeah, they made a giant piece of bread for this kind of, uh, what you know, you, you know when they do the the photos with captions to tell the story? Well, they did one on Night of the Living Bread, you know, a riff on Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, they had this giant piece of bread. So, of course, you know, clearly there was something missing from a scene in which... You know, uh, Dorothy LeMay's giving a blowjob to a guy in a giant cream of wheat box. <laughs> and of course, that is a guy in a giant piece of bread playing a saxophone. And, um, you know, and I think that that's incredible. Why, why are there more films like that? And, and frankly, you know, is this really that different from, say, a Matthew Barney, like, Craymaster Cycle type film? I don't think it is. I think it's just that he's coming from one world and, and Sadin's coming from another. But they both end up in the same space. Uh, and my question to the uh, the art community as a whole is why then does Matthew Barney get a um, free pass for the Serpentine Gallery and Sayedin doesn't? I'm sure there are legitimate arguments for that which reflect much more refined taste than I possess and, and everything else. But but the way I perceive it, no, that Sayedin should have equal right to be in the Serpentine Gallery and in a grindhouse you know, you can be in both. You know, Lynch can be screening a razor head in a, the new art uh, and, and also have a retrospective at the Cartier Foundation in Paris. You can do both. Yeah. You can exist in both spaces. Uh, Joel Peter Wick can, can be, I don't know, referenced in a, an, you know, a, a horror film or, a, like, or, or, or appear in a gallery. You know, you can, those distinctions, I won't say that they're, they no longer exist. I question if they ever existed in the first place. Mm. Um, you know, and again, we go back to somebody like Francis Bacon. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm going. On, I'm going on a polemic, a Sunday <laughs> afternoon polemic. <laughs> so or um, rant, but a polemic. I, I think, as I've been told, it's just a. Pol- when I use the word polemic, it, 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 no, no, it's not a polemic. It's just a rant, Daniel. Well, it's it's <laughs> so, our tradition as yeah, whenever yeah, we do yeah. podcasts, we need at least one small rant. 
Okay, well, you're welcome. I'll, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep it to one, so you know, you can enjoy your Sunday. So, um, and before I forget, the um, did, when you were uh, searching for the title of that other film, did you say After Blue? Yes, I think I did. Okay, then you got it right because I just looked it up. All right. Well, that's good. Oh yeah. no, it, it is. Don't don't get, don't get me wrong. It is great. Uh, and and, and I, I love Bertrand and what he does. I'm just saying that they're coming from two different places. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that it's, I don't think it's anything, I, I think it's a challenge for filmmakers today because, you know, I, I, when, when I first met Bertrand about yeah 15 years ago, I mean, he, he is a cinephile of the highest order. He knows everything. Yeah. Uh, and he's got everything. And, you know, so, so basically this is... Uh, let, let's say the the Tarantino of the the cult and the bazaar, uh, somebody with an encyclopedic knowledge who's able to who who who's able to 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 go into their memory bank and pick out a reference, and then their their, their kind of their genius and their skill is finding another reference to combine it with, and then they'll come out with something which is unique, bizarre, and interesting. At the same time, though, uh, I think. If you have any kind of cursory knowledge of cult film, music, art, and video, you kind of you're familiar with the references, and um, that isn't quite the same experience as as, as it was the case of um, watching Night Dreams or Cafe Flash. You may get the references to Night Dream, but you certainly wouldn't at that particular moment of time have seen them put together like that. Like you may have listened to. Morton Subotnik, like Sidewinder or the, the Wild Bull on a record or a radio program, but it's unlikely you would have ever seen them in the context of a porn film before. Uh, so I think that maybe this is a, a broader cultural problem about what do you do when you're, you're trapped in the cul-de-sac hall of mirrors that is postmodernism. Um, you know, what, what do you do when everything's kind of done before other than, you know, uh, collage and combine them in a different way? Um, but I'm more interested, okay, so who, who, if there are going to be filmmakers doing what Sadin and Stahl did back then, I don't think they would be doing pastiche type films. I think they would be doing something else. Um, and I don't know what that is. Uh, and, and, you know, and if we did know what it is, then it wouldn't be shocking. So, um, yeah, I, I think that we need to find, um, uh, more innovative and imaginative ways of shocking people, and when I use the term shock, I mean shock in the um, the sort of Eisenstein montage of attractions way, not the I'm outraged and I'm going on Twitter because you're a racist bastard. That kind of, <laughs> because that's not that's not really shocking. That's not even that's that's like rubbing your hands with glee, thinking right, I can you know knock that person off a peg or two. And possibly forward my own internet presence at the same time. That's not shock. That's that's kind of, you know, because it's it's outrage in inverted commas. It, it's mm. it's the signification of outrage rather than rather than actual outrage. Because usually the emotion I'm guessing is glee and satisfaction that somebody's painted themselves into a corner and you can knock them down. But actual shock, actual things which really um, change your perception, sort of jolt you. Uh, like the mother and the whore, which I saw yesterday, which you know, in 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 by today's standards, it's it's almost prosaic. You know, what four hours of talking in a bar, and and the the menage a trois is basically lifting up a quilt and sliding into bed. I'll wait for the motorbikes to pass. Uh, but. I did find the film shocking for me because it's so different from what I'm usually used to watching. Uh, it's nothing to do with the length because, of course, streaming makes all this long-form content easily possible. But the rhythm of the film, the uh, the the simplicity, and the um, uh, the, the I, I I can never remember which way around it is when you're talking about diegetic and non-diegetic music. But the fact that all the music was in the film. Uh, I think all of those factors uh, really made the film shocking for me. Yeah. And uh, even if it's an old film, even if it's a classic, for me, I found it personally shocking in the way that it sort of like jolted me. Maybe I'd become saturated with, you know, editing and you know, music and things like this. So uh, it, it really, uh, that for me was a shocking film. And 
And I would like to see more shocking films like that. And I think that if you want to be shocked during the latter part of this year, a good place to start would be Dr. Caligari and Cafe Flesh. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, You can hear more about Daniel Bird and Heather Drain on my episodes on them for supporting characters. And uh, be sure to watch Justine Smith's Masterclass with Stephen Sadian on YouTube before you do anything else today. I don't care how urgent it is. And join me on the uh, next episode of Directors Club to hear my conversation with Gianna D'Amelio on the films of writer-director Mia Hansen-Love. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Bill Ackerman.